Hi, everybody. My name is Micah Salkind. I'm a PhD candidate in American Studies here at Brown. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Mark Ruppel, who will then introduce and moderate the first panel this morning. Dr. Ruppel is a program officer with the National Endowment of the Humanities. He completed his PhD at the University of Maryland College Park, where he wrote a dissertation that applies social network visualization as a tool in understanding audience, media, and narratives in transmedia fiction. Mark has worked on projects ranging from the NSF-funded educational alternate reality game, The Arcane Gallery of Gadgetry, to Robot Heart Stories, and has published several articles on transmedia practices in journals such as Convergence, the International Journal of Research into New Media, and the International Journal of Learning and Media. So here he is, Mark Ruppel. Thank you, Micah. That was always humbling and embarrassing, flattering. Uh, give me one second. Talk to so yeah, I'm from the NEH, where I am um, senior program officer, and uh, no. And as luck has it, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. 50th anniversary of our founding. And it's an interesting time to kind of reflect on what NEH has done and where we're going. Um, so one of the things that I, I have to say here, I'm almost obligated to say, is stay tuned. Look to NEH.gov for events locally. Um, we're trying to really cast a wide net in the context of this anniversary and really reach everyone. There's programs that we're funding, events that we're holding, that we're doing across hopefully all 50 states that will likely get a lot of the word out um, about a lot of the work that we've done. Um, most of it, um, I, I think, has some really direct bearing on what we're going to be talking about today, including a conference on the future of the humanity that's coming up down in Virginia. Um, so I work in the Division of Public Program, and just as a little bit of an overview for the panel, I want to talk a bit about what NEH has done um, in terms of funding mobile development and mobile story, and then also give a little bit of a provocation about what a mobile documentary might be. Because I think one of the real things that drew me to this conference, and one of the things that Marissa and I first spoke about was the real tension um, between what's taking place in mobile development and the really nascent language or dialects that are starting to form around the way that we design, strategize, and tell stories with mobile. There's different genres. And if we really poke hard enough, and if we look close enough, we can start to see where they're beginning to separate. So I, in the Division of Public Programs, as I said previously, we tell stories within the human. Um, we are one little division in NEH um, that really works alongside the other divisions, especially the Office of Digital Humanities, uh, to push forward with projects that will reach a wide general public. So we fund documentary films, museum exhibits, um, public programming uh, that at libraries, historic sites, museums, spaces like that. Uh, we fund radio projects, uh, so American Roots documentaries that would be on NPR, we oftentimes have a hand in. Um, but one of the biggest things that we want to do with our projects is make sure that our portfolio as a whole really does reach a wide swath of the U.S. public. Increasingly, that's moving to digital. Um, and m most of my work at NEH is centered around really growing that aspect of what we do. Traditionally, always funded digital projects through our other grant lines, but recently we broke it out and began a new grant line called Digital Projects for the Public that's really exclusively pushing towards funding these types of projects and engagement. So here's just a quick overview of some of our work with mobile platforms and projects to date. And this is a mix of projects that have been funded through public programs and also the Office of Digital Humanities that really does focus on that tool and platform end of things, where there could be multiple uses for one particular platform. Um, whereas in our division, in public programs, we really do focus on stories, on telling stories with the humanities through whatever tool to do that best. Um, so we did fund CurateScape in its early days through the Office of Digital Humanities. And Mark DeBow is here with us and will be running a session later on about CurateScape. But it's a wonderful platform that's really extensible in the way that it allows for cultural heritage tourism and for storytelling through cultural heritage uh, to really, really be something that's reachable, doable for a lot of institutions. Um, someone on the panel today will be actually talking about a CurateScape project, so I don't want to really steal any thunder. And I'll move on from here. But it's worth noting that CurateScape has really spun off into a lot of different projects for us. This one is called McClecky. Um, it's a collaboration between Mastino University and Cleveland State University. 
And it's essentially a mobile application or platform um, of Curatescape that allows you to really explore the history of Kisumu, Kenya. Um, and allows the people on the ground in, in Kisumu to explore their own history, to share them, create them, curate pathways through their state that both local and global audiences can understand. We also funded a project at the Adler Planetarium called Digital Historic Scott, which uses mobile technology to allow for audiences to actually impose old cartographic um, history over uh, the, the, the skies at both the planetarium itself and then outdoors in whatever location they would, they would uh, find themselves. So it's a way of looking at old maps, watching the way that the skies have shifted, learning about the histories involved in the map, the way that they were interpreted. Um, another uh, project that we funded recently is called Makutu, and it's from uh, Washington State University. And this is a platform that allows for indigenous communities to collate, share, and manage their own cultural heritage. Um, the barrier of entry is really low, so it allows for users of all different types of expertise to do this. And it also does have a real mobile dimension, too, in that they can begin to map and actually tag the locations of where a lot of these collections are coming from. And stories have begun to form between a few of them. Um, Dinita Gregar at Washington State also um, developed something called Fort Vancouver Mobile. And this is a walking tour app of sorts um, that incorporates alternate reality game types of dynamics. So you're exploring the space um, with different types of interaction looking for objects, searching in, in a goal-oriented type of, uh, of way. And it's been a real, uh, a, a real boon, I think, to uh, a lot of what we've done, both in uh, that space itself at Fort Vancouver, but also for the field as a whole. The National Park Service has adopted part of this with Brett Oppegaard um, as a model for the movement going forward. Um, this is an interesting project out of the Bay Area in San Francisco. It's KQED's Let's Get Lost platform. We funded a project for them, a module, uh, based on the New Deal murals and tours of the New Deal murals around that area that really does both look at them as individual objects and then also ties the story together as a whole as you move across different spaces. Another project, the Ancient Ohio Trail um, out in Ohio, uh, looked at the Earthworks map and actually offers audiences and visitors of that space a virtual reconstruction of the Earthworks mounds as they would have existed hundreds and hundreds of years ago um, as they're exploring the space itself. Play the Past, which uh, Jim Matheson, who's from Field Day, uh, who will be talking later on today, will have probably more to say. Uh, this is a project that we funded through Minnesota Historical Society. It's a use of mobile apps and mobile technologies in the museum space that allows for audiences and visitors to interact with the exhibits in a way that I think is really wholly unique. So for example, there's a mining exhibit um, that children can engage with that allows them to take on the roles of either mine foremen or workers. You can organize strike. You can um, deal with disasters, and then you can tell these stories in a way that I think uh, allows them to be packed up and shifted back to the classroom. Sharon Leone at George Mason University was the project director for another mobile app that we funded called Histories of the National Mall. And this has been um, a really popular um, app for a lot of cultural heritage tourism in the DC area, simply because it allows you to explore the space of them and impose different kind of historical understandings of what's taking place there. Um, in the midst of your travel. So all these points on the map here represent photographs, videos, audio clips, and text-based um, interpretations of what's happening. It's, a, it's again been something that uh, we've seen some real uptick with. And then finally, and I don't want to say too much about this, this is Murder at Beacon Hill from Michael Epstein, who's also on the panel with us today. And um, it's an interesting project in a lot of ways. And I'll let Michael describe the specifics of it, but um, in, in, in very, very real sense, I think it represents some of the future directions of what mobile development in the space can do. So these were all mobile projects in their own way, right? And these are all mobile platforms. And I think that's in some sense uncontestable. But the real question that I think I want to just leave us with here is what is a mobile documentary? Because the name of this session is mobile documentary. And I think it's a contested term. And I like the fact that it's contested. That we're not really sure what that means. And that it's possible that the speakers yesterday, the speakers that will follow, all in some sense could be considered a mobile documentary. So I just want to push for a second on just what that might mean, offer some thoughts, and again, some provocations about where we might go in kind of defining this field and give us some framework to kind of look at what's taking place here. Because the three panelists that are going to follow all have really wildly different approaches in some ways as to what this type of experience might mean. So it could mean podcast tours, GIS-enabled media. In other words, you walk through a space that triggers a photograph or a media artifact. 
location-specific interactions where it may ask you to explore space and actually touch the side of the brick of the building and engage in a tactile way of, of actually um, exploring what uh, the space itself means. But it also means something else. It means characters, it means places, it means events. It means storytelling, it means narrative. And it means constructing that narrative across the space that in some ways allows for a heightened engagement with that space. So there's a lot going on right now about interactive documentaries. You've likely heard the term thrown around. Now, interactive documentaries, importantly, aren't always mobile. That's the point in some sense. So a project like the Hollow documentary by Emily McMillian um, allows the space to come to you, to your desktop, to your, to your PC, to your tablet. And if you haven't engaged with the Hollow, it's really kind of fascinating. You scroll down and all these sorts of different interactions happen. Film clips play, maps appear, and you really get a sense of this space. And she keeps updating it and curating it. Um, and it's essentially about branding, brain drain, excuse me, and population um, from the industrial area. Fort McMoney, David Dufresne, another really popular interactive documentary at the moment, one that meshes film and documentary types of practices with game mechanics. But again, the question that I think is worth asking with these types of examples here is what makes a mobile documentary unique? What makes it something that's worthy of us talking about here? And what makes it something that's worthy exploring in the context of the arts, the humanities, and cultural heritage? So if a traditional documentary attempts to capture or interpret or narrativize reality, like our friend Nanook here, a mobile documentary attempts to capture, interpret, and narrativize reality to create experience of that space or environment. In other words, it gets us out to the places where these things happen. But rather than information about a place where you go somewhere you can access information that doesn't have that story element, mobile documentaries imbue that location the tactile sense of the hidden story that are possible. Maybe. And this works with something that I call really loosely spatial contingency. The ability for a story to take you into a place and show you those pivot points where something happened. History, events, places where people and their lives were made. So where are we going with this? I just want to offer a couple of quick trends that I see from our point of view in terms of what we're getting. And while I can't speak specifically about this process, it's one of the things that makes my job and these sorts of talks difficult. We can't talk about either proposals that are pending or proposals that were submitted and weren't funded. Um, what I will talk about are kind of high-level trends that we see in terms of the project that we get in from mobile. So there's an awful lot going on in terms of mobile development right now, and it pulls from multiple fields, from film to radio, to museums, to historic sites, <laughs> digital, experiential design. That, and they're all working sometimes in tandem and sometimes separately. So there's a whole of media production that's taking place here that I think is really fascinating to look at because everyone is turning to these tools in some ways, and they're all bringing their own expertise and their own approaches to what it takes to develop a mobile project. We're also seeing a real distinction between linear and nonlinear pathway. And one of the interesting things about this, and this is no surprise because this is how digital media works, is that with linear pathways, we're seeing a real restriction of what's possible with the archive, with archival content, where photographs, film clips, audio clips, things like that aren't as rampant. And in nonlinear paths, what we're seeing is people often building from archival content and allowing for that openness to really take place. So this is, in some ways, representative of what I see as a kind of third stage digital media development, right? So first, we realized that we could digitize something. Second, we slapped a usable interface on top of it and called it public. And now we're dealing with the trickiest part of the business, telling stories from all these collections of objects, figuring out ways to narrativize them in a way that really makes it personal, makes sense to audiences. And this is taking place in the usual place, too. We see we see a lot of people struggling with this, this movement from universities, museums, historic sites, but also, interestingly, public broadcasters. So there's a whole slew of public broadcasters out there across the U.S. who realize they're now sitting on these massive archives of media objects, and they want to do something with them. And a lot of them are turning to mobile media and mobile experiences as a way to help them both understand what's in their collection and also help the public engage with it more deeply. So again, this is a distinction between archives and artifacts tagged with GIS data and projects using this data for mobile engagement. We're not just going somewhere and looking at something. We're being given away. 
Interesting thing too, and this is kind of a sidebar, is what I'm really seeing through a lot of these projects is a return to sound as a way of designing. And some of the projects today will really touch on that. So this isn't an NEH project. This also isn't a mobile project. But it's one that I think is really re representative of where the field is likely shifting. And this is Emily Thompson's Roaring Twenties, the website that essentially maps the sounds of the 1920s New York City and allows you to explore. There's film clips involved. There's audio clips. One of the newsreels, for example, allows you to take a walk up a street filled with music shops that were all blaring different records, different instruments out of their windows, out of their space, and attempt to compete with each other, how do each other. So it gives you a sense of exploring space through very, very sensory means. And it's not hard to think about how that could actually be translated to the streets of New York, right? It wouldn't be that much of a leap to translate this to mobile. Also wouldn't be that much of a leap to take something like, say, the National Mall, which is an older project by this band, actually, called Blue Brain, who designed the National Mall in a completely different way than what took place with our National Mall app um, that I mentioned earlier. They designed it through sound. They made it a walkable record. So as you move through the space of the mall, you wind up triggering different sound clips. And doing so completes this piece of music and completes an experience that really brings you deeply in touch in a lot of ways with some of the objects and monuments present in the mall. Again, it's not hard to figure out how we might extend these sorts of dynamics. <clears throat> and this isn't a project itself, it's just a hypothetical. It wouldn't be hard to imagine, for example, a mobile app that uses sound to capture and recreate some of the experiences of the MLK march on Washington. Where, for example, <clears throat> you might be someone who showed up on a bus and are asked to find someone from your church or from your AME network, for example, just by listening for a choir, listening for a hymnal being sung in the background and moving towards that sound. So we're asked to see, we're asked to hear, we're asked to feel, to touch, to smell sometimes through mobile projects, and we're asked to interpret it again. And that's what I really think these panelists will offer today, different ways of looking at those types of dynamics and those types of interpretations. Anyone know what this is? This is, go ahead. The Alamo? No, it's not the Alamo. This is the Piazza of the Knights of Malta in Rome. Um, you probably couldn't be further off. Um, and this is a line of people who wait for hours to do this, to look through its keyhole. And they look out at St. Peter's Dome, and they look through this particular doorway as a way of experiencing it in a way that's restricted, but yet in some sense, highly, highly engaging. I use this example always when I teach design for both mobile and for narrative architectures, things like that, and also when I'm working on projects with different types of folks. It's a way of kind of conceiving of what we do here, of what everyone on this panel does, of what mobile development really does at its best. It's creating a perspective that oftentimes is restricted. We're all restricting what we're dealing with here when we talk about some of these, these stories and these collections we're working with. But oftentimes it's more productive to look through the people than to open the door. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'll introduce our speakers now, uh, or somebody else will. And uh, feel free to poke holes at anything I said later on in the discussion. Um, but I'll step down now, and uh, we'll get to the good people.
He is now working on Museum of the Hidden City, which I'm very excited about. He calls it a live documentary investigating the affordable housing system in my hometown of San Francisco. So I am pleased to welcome to the stage Michael Epstein.
you, you lose that, that storytelling rhythm. People jump out and jump back in. I realized too that people didn't like standing, you know, looking at a device like this for even more than a minute in the middle of a beautiful neighborhood. They wanted to interact with their surroundings, and the film just wasn't made for that. And then second, there's that issue of linearity that, that Mark was talking about. That the chronology gets all screwed up if people start jumping from place to place to place. Films aren't made for that. But I realized I was at kind of the, 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 the forefront of what could be a really interesting challenge. Um, and so what I began to think about more and more was that, that sort of isolation of cinema. And what I want to talk about today is really what I would say is sort of striking a balance. Trying to figure out how we can, if you want to use the word disrupt, you know, cinematic and documentary storytelling by putting it in real places in a way that makes you much more active with the media. Like Mark was saying, more tactile, more there. I mean, you can imagine history, uh, historical narr narratives experienced in a place where they have them could definitely heighten the experience. Also with social issues, I'll talk about that. I think this place-based storytelling can make you much more sy sympathetic to issues or, or, or more um, um, convinced of, of, the, the, of, of certain uh, viewpoints. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to lose the wonderful um, narrative progress that cinema has made over the last century. You know, the, the incredible mo um, natural habits that they've built in us for us to be able to sit for two hours and just be engrossed in a story. And so really, I'm, I'm going to be talking today about the marriage of the two in, in three projects. And the first one is, is the Murder on Beacon Hill project in 2009. Uh, and it, it was funded by a, a digital humanities startup grant, but its roots actually go back to 1990 when Simon Schama wrote a book called Dead Certainties. And he was really interested in how we do history and how we can use small fictions to connect parts of archival history that don't necessarily uh, mesh so well. But there was a film made about his process in 2003 uh, called Murder at Harvard. And then what I wanted to do in the in mobile was really not, not replicate the film or the book, but really extend a component of the story, which was about um, the relationship of two men that were involved in an unsolved crime 150 years ago. Basically, uh, one morning, um, about a week after the disappearance of one of the wealthiest men in Boston, uh, his body parts were discovered at the bottom of a Harvard professor's privy on the Harvard Medical School campus. And that set off a sort of O.J. Simpson-like trial that lasted for months to figure out if this Harvard professor was guilty or not of killing the man. And what I was really interested in was in the relationship between these two characters that neither the book or the film fully explored. It merely touched upon it. Um, so again, this was funded by a digital uh, humanities startup grant. But I'd also note that the American Experience film that it was built on also received um, NEH funding. So this is a real an NEH uh, a baby in a lot of ways. And um, I'm just going to play a clip. Basically, the way that the, the project worked is you had uh, on your phone a map that you followed, an old map, and it had um, hot spots. And when you got to hot spots, there was videos uh, that you would play that sort of got you into those places. So I'll just show you the, the first video that you get, uh, which starts on um, uh, Mass General's uh, campus in Boston. And we might need to adjust the sound a bit if it's In the center of the Massachusetts General Hospital, in this old granite building, is a little amphitheater. They call it the Ether Dome. Hold up this video and go inside with me. This is where surgery lost its main ingredient, pain. In 1846, when a patient awoke here from a procedure removing a throat tumor and couldn't recall any pain, Boston's men of medicine got giddy with human possibilities. Now, now, take it easy. You would step down a few stairs from the ether dome, and you see an early photograph showing this building and the Harvard Medical College next to it. See those windows in the first floor? That's Professor Webster's laboratory. And in 1849, just three years after the medical miracle of ether, 
A gruesome discovery was made in the mud flats under Webster's lab. This revelation was also talked about around the world, but more as a savage stain on the intellectual fabric of Boston. The building is gone, but not all of it. Some still remains, very close to where you're standing now. So what you saw at the end there is actually they still have the pilings of the uh, building where the professor worked and, and basically around where the body was found or parts of the body. And I, I was blown away how just these little fragments heightened the story so much for people, you know, just to see pieces of living proof of what happened uh, in the midst of the story it really focuses attention and makes people feel like there's part of a sort of privileged secret that's happening in the world around them. Um, the other thing that we found is that this type of sort of use of archival and, and historical footage uh, activates all types of audiences. I think one of the biggest compliments we got was from uh, a young woman who said she wanted to do the tour again, but with her parents. And I was like, how many things do 20-year-olds want to ever do with their parents? So uh, I thought, you know, that, that might be a small breakthrough there. Um, but but uh, the other part uh, with, with artifacts is that, you know, we, we, we sort of got the idea that, okay, you're going to go around to about seven places during this tour on about a one-mile path. And maybe we should just sort of have small artifacts that we've kind of staged and recreated and put there. And um, what we got very interested in is that right around the time of the murder, um, the, um, the game of life, the board game of life, you know, with a little spinny wheel, was just coming out, and it was a morality board game. It was actually avoid going to hell and see if you could get to heaven through this kind of checkerboard uh, design. And so we, we basically recreated the game board, but put, instead of you know just normal uh, player pegs, we had characters from the story who were all involved in a sort of morality tale uh, on, this, on, on this game board. And we stashed it with a concierge at, at a hotel that at one time was the jail uh, where, where Webster was held um, um, for, for a little while. So. Um, so the place ties into the story, but people love this. You know, the idea that they could go up to the concierge and say, oh, can I play the Parkman game and he'd give you this thing. We, we had many people who were like in love with this. So this, this, you know, was kind of one of the big learnings that we had is that, you know, when you do a digital project, especially in real space, installations can become very, very important. Um, also, we did figure out, I mean, you could hear from the music and the kind of setup that you can also create narrative tension, that narrative tension does work in, the, in what I'm calling uh, narratives or terrestrial narratives. It's still great narrative tension. And then we sort of had this dual format where when you were stopped at these places, you got video, but in between uh, the stops, you know, maybe the three to five minute walks, uh, we had audio uh, that was kind of musical and gave you more background about the story. Uh, and so that shift between audio and video also seemed to work well. Um, the biggest issue with it was that it was completely I would say completely, but there was no real ties between the film and the mobile. You know, that, that they slightly referenced each other, but it wasn't like you'd watch the film, because the film was made six years earlier, and you'd be, oh, now I'm going to do the mobile. And sort of vice versa, the mobile kind of hints at moments of the film, but it didn't feel like we were going to jump up and go see the film. Um, and then the audience, you know, you go and you do stuff and you find things, but it wasn't like the audience really could contribute to the story. They were still, in some ways, very passive. There wasn't really a role for them, especially on the platform itself. Uh, and then we did find that, you know, the experience is about an hour, but after 30 minutes, people were getting tired. There's sort of exhaustion to it. And uh, that might have been, you know, I just think with these things, you can always overestimate how much um, energy people have for it. So I was thinking, you know, maybe we need to look at a shorter form than an hour. Uh, at least as an option for people. Uh, and then those issues uh, began to, to resolve somewhat in, in a project uh, that we did uh, a couple of years ago and then just updated uh, this year. It's called uh, Posts from Gloucester, and it's a, it's a play on the word uh, uh, sending a post in a postcard, but also physical posts that you can find around Gloucester. And that, that was one of the brilliant bases of this project, is that it was a digital media project that was done in tandem with a large-scale place-making place project. Uh, basically, the city of Gloucester got over a million dollars of funding to create a harbor walk. And so along this harbor walk, as you can see, there was uh, a, quite a bit of signage. But built into that signage were clues about, uh, not clues, but 
um, basically uh, signs that you could scan to get to this walking cinema experience. And so we had a stake in the ground. Literally, we had posts uh, that we could use to tell the story. And so I thought, you know, wow, that's that's pretty official, and that's going to create a lot a lot more participation. And I'll get back to that in a second about how it worked. Um, but what we also really cranked up in this one was the idea of the installations, uh, the idea that you could physically um, experience the place. And I'll just show you uh, briefly what, how that played out. And again, we might need to adjust the volume as I as I play this. And. Uh, so this is, you know, the, the interface uh, for the project, and very similar to uh, Run Around Beacon Hill, you get a map uh, with a walking path. Uh, if you're on it, it will show you your GPS positions, and you can pretty easily walk and follow it. And it's, it's much shorter form. Um, there's two 15-minute experiences along this path, and the second experience um, deals uh, with the story of Howard Blackburn. Uh, basically, it's a man who, um, um, is kind of like a folk hero of the town. And I'll just show you how it plays out. You know, as, as you walk, you get to these specific uh, points. And uh, the sort of second episode in that Howard Blackburn story is called Holding Oars. And uh, it's, yeah, you just press it, and then the, uh, the story should start up. And again, we might need to adjust the volume. You should be next to the door. Go ahead, get inside and have a seat up front. Feel free to set your phone in the little box at the front of the door. You can watch the video while you row. For centuries, Gloucester fishermen fished from these little boats. The dories were lowered into the water, and in teams of two, the fishermen rowed away from the schooner. They knew that once they left the mothership, anything could happen. Howard Blackburn was out in the Grand Banks. He was in the 16-foot dory with Tom Welsh. They're out looking. The storm blows up. The temperature's getting colder and colder. When they spent the night, they couldn't make it back to the mother vessel. And in the morning, it was gone. Howard Blackburn, he started to row. And the boat, it was taking water on, and they had to take turns bailing. And Howard took his wool mitts off and set them down in the water. And when Tom Welsh went to bail, the first thing he bailed out was those mitts. Tom looked up and said, Howard, your, your hands, they're freezing up. And Howard looked down, and they were. They did the only thing he could. He froze his fingers on the oars, and it closed so he could still row. Go ahead. Lock your hands on the oars and imagine rowing. And rowing with hands stuck to the oars. You can almost feel that numbness in your face, your fingers. Now hold that feeling and take a postcard. Whoever takes the picture, you should step back from the room and you should hold those oars like they're your only hope for survival. It'll be like an SOS card from the boat, and you'll relive how numb Blackburn must have been, physically and mentally. So this is where we really tried to bring the audience, the participants, in, into the story. And you can literally uh, make a postcard. Um, and uh, I'll just, do you mind volunteering for a second? Sure. Okay. Yeah, you just stand up. And you have to grimace. You found a little bit more in the light. Yeah, thank you. And I just need a grimace of sorts. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so now you have a postcard. Uh, you're not in a boat, so it doesn't get the full effect. Um, but, you know, basically, these, the, you know, this kind of augmented reality, um, yeah, yeah, augmented reality experience uh, became, you know, a new addition uh, to, um, what sorry, I'm just about that. Uh, a new addition to kind of how we were doing our storytelling. Um, what, what I liked about it in, in the you know, cinematic sense of, of what we're doing is that it, um, it, it, it broke up in a sense the, uh, yeah, it broke up in 
a sense the, the, the sort of locking you into your phone for an hour. That you actually had to like take a step back, take a picture, you know, grimace, like, and, and, and you'll see, I mean, people might really be enjoying these mobile documentaries, but if you look at their faces, a lot of times they look like they're dead. You know, they're just kind of like off in this world. And then afterwards you're like, oh, it looked like you hated it, you were bored. And like, no, no, I loved it. But, you know, expressively it's very hard for uh, people to get involved. So this was a chance for people to, to physically experience the place. And I'd also say this stretched the age group out uh, for this story. You know, that, that we could go, we were testing it with, it with these young as five-year-olds, and they were enjoying uh, both the stories and the photo taking. Uh, and so, you know, and th again, that sort of is, is one of the uber goals of what we're trying to do is give an experience that stretches across uh, generations and has different value uh, for each. Um, this won the uh, Gold Muse Award uh, um, in 2013. Uh, and so, you know, I think the, these kind of projects are beginning to get recognized. And, um, and then it also, you know, th these, these photos can be shared online. We're beginning to see some of them um, appear on Facebook. And so, you know, I'll give you the link so you can check out that screen. Uh, but it's another way for us to begin to activate social media channels and, and more personalization of, of the tours. Uh, so, yes, bigger installations seem to be working. This episodic approach, too, seemed to work, sort of making it shorter. So if you only wanted to spend, say, 15 minutes and just do one of the stories rather than both of them, it kind of worked out. Uh, and then this photo taking, this kind of idea of a media break uh, also seemed to work. Um, the, the thing that was, you know, uh, felt a little bit uncomfortable about this one was that uh, it, it felt more anecdotal. Like it didn't have a strong art like you would if you sat in a theater for two hours and really got engrossed. It was more sort of this, you know, 10 to 15 minutes with Howard Blackburn. He has a smaller art and another story about uh, the town's uh, Italian traditions. And you kind of move on. Um, also, you know, just with all of these projects, your audience size is very limited unless you're doing something in Times Square where you get five million visitors a year. You know, that, that the physical experience of the place limits your audience size, the size especially in a city like Gloucester. Um, and then I think we, you know, in a sense, um, this was, the idea of building this harbor walk was an incredibly contentious uh, idea. You know, um, Gloucester still prides itself as a working blue-collar town. And in a way, this project sort of uh, make, makes them a little bit more like their much more touristy neighborhood, neighbor, Manchester by the Sea. And there was actually people who we interviewed were kind of on the edge about you know, this kind of touristic intervention. And so you know, I feel like some of these you know, more historical narratives can ignore some of the facts on the ground uh, that, that make, I think, that create a, a cinematic interest. Um, and so that leads me to the uh, final project that I want to talk about. And um, with this one, um, I, I really wanted to try to um, create something longer form, uh, but that also had interest in, in current issues in San Francisco, as uh, Nia uh, alluded to. And um, basically, uh, the, the, I mean, if, if you're aware that San Francisco is, is turning into the most expensive housing market in the country, uh, I think the average price of a one-bedroom apartment to rent is three thousand five hundred dollars, and so um, the you know the, the 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 sort of face of that story is that oh it's the whole city's being gentrified, and I began to look into it. The interesting thing that I found is that uh, especially in neighborhoods towards the center of the city, uh, uh, Soma, where, where Nia's from, Mid Market, the Tenderloin. Many of those buildings are actually owned and operated by the nonprofits and by cities, and those are locked in. There's also laws and structural uh, limitations that are going to keep many of those buildings from ever becoming, um, you know, high-end housing. Uh, and so, um, what one local writer, Gary Camilla, said is that in the end, the scenario uh, is what he called the involved stakeholder scenario. Posits that the neighborhood actually stabilizes into a functioning crazy quilt a block to block, building to building patchwork of wealth and poverty, blacks and whites, Asians and Latinos, SROs, those are single room occupancy, <coughs> hotel rooms next to renovated apartments, supportive housing beside new condos. And I really became interested in, in exploring what does this matchup, mashup of rich and poor look like sociologically. Uh, and so I, I began to look for places where um, Wealth and poverty are living right next to each other. And I discovered this really interesting um, mechanism. And uh, I'm just going to play a bit of this. 
you know, try to figure out what, what you're looking at. Does anybody know what this is? Any idea? Is Shout out. What is it? No, not for schools. Well, yes, housing lottery. It's a housing lottery at the public library. And so this mashup of wealth and poverty is actually engineered into the city that every new residential building that has more than 10 units has to create at least 12% affordable units. And most of those affordable units go to people who are make, making less than 50% of the average media income. Now, th so that's, in, in San Francisco, is a really narrow gap between, like, say, 30 to $35,000 a year for a family of, uh, of two. And so um, what's actually happening is that the new buildings that are being built, for, which for all intents and purposes are luxury housing, are actually programmed with a certain percentage of people who are making much less than the people who can afford the market rate units. And one of those buildings is called uh, NEMA. It's kind of like SOHO, but it's a made up, uh, I guess, acronym for a neighborhood that doesn't exist yet uh, called New Market. I mean, they're basically a neighborhood that has a name. Uh, it's, it's called South of Market, SOMA, but they're calling it NEMA, New Market. Um, and, it's, and they're building these, uh, what they call next-gen luxury rentals. And, uh, and what, what they want to build is what they call an inspired community. Uh, but 12% of that inspired community are going to be people who are from uh, the housing lottery. And so I became very interested in meeting um, going into this particular building and seeing if in that building we could kind of get a sense of the of the society in a sense that, that, that may become the future of, of San Francisco. Uh, and in particular, um, I met one family called the, the Ramirez family and um, they had an incredible uh, struggle to get into their uh, apartment because they did meet the income requirements but they had um, their credit score was like 20 points shy of, of what the limit should be. So they went through this crazy uh, two month, um, really it was just like a hustle to, to try to make that credit score go up. And they did finally get into the building. And when they got into the building, I'm just gonna play an episode of, 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 uh, of the film. Um, Y sí, ya después de eso, pues ya recibimos la carta en noviembre 26, fueron que septiembre, octubre, dos meses, dos meses peleando, dos meses que yo anduve moviendo así literal, dos meses que cada mañana, cada mañana yo venía aquí al edificio a poner mis manos y yo decía, este, este apartamento va a ser mío porque va a ser mío. Cuando yo entré al lobby, desde que entré al lobby, yo iba emocionada, yo iba apretada, lo dejé todo morado a mi pobre marido porque él lo apretaba y yo quiso ver qué vamos a vivir. Me lleva 
Eh, nos llevan a la donde está la piscina y luego nos llevan al 24 piso que es en la skyline que se mira toda la ciudad que es hermoso. Tú puedes ir y venir a hacer tu, tu tarde atada, ir a, al gimnasio, tú no, tú no tienes ninguna restricción, tú vas a utilizar todas las uh, amenities, ¿cómo te dicen? Lo primero también que pregunté fue, ¿tienen playground para los niños? Y me dijeron, no. Pero a lo mejor me dijo, Eugene, en un futuro a lo mejor se piensa en algo así. Entonces, este, porque creo que este edificio está condicionado más que todo para familias solteras, o para, para gente que no tiene niños, uh, porque tiene más cosas los, las mascotas, tienen más... Uh, comodidad para la mascota que para un niño. Tienen un spa, tienen un spa perrito. Tienen un spa perrito. ¿Te pongo aquí a bañarte? ¿Por qué no? Yo no sé quiénes son los del frente, porque nunca me saludan. Solo veo que siempre me salen y se quiénes son. Si hacen eventos, lo hacen solamente para, para, para la gente que pues, va a hablar, va a hablar de su negocio, va a hablar de su cosa. Yo no puedo llegar y decir, oiga, yo soy housekeeper en un hotel. Y este, con los empleados, sí, todo bien. Y él me habla por mi nombre y habla con mi nombre por, mi, por su nombre a, a mi esposo. Entonces se siente bonito porque los empleados igual no dan el mismo trato que a todos. Entonces, pero la, la gente no. Ellos quizás mmm, se les imagina, a lo mejor hasta han llegado a pensar que quizás haya, nosotros estemos aparte y ellos aparte o qué sé yo, o está sucediendo en Nueva York, en un edificio en el que vamos a hacer. Y, y, y se imagina si, si lo pusieran en PMR a un lado y los ricos, los que pagan, sí, los que van del apartamento a otro lado, sería todo. Que igual no seríamos una comunidad porque paguemos más o paguemos menos, vivimos en un mismo edificio y como tal tendríamos que vivir juntos. It's the perspective uh, that we decided to tell the story from. Uh, this is actually one of those observational telescopes that's at the top of Twin Peaks, and it's looking out into the fog. Uh, the fog, of course, becomes a kind of metaphor for how we're dealing with our, our housing crisis in, in San Francisco. But what's interesting uh, about the story and the dilemma that uh, Yesenia and her family find herself in is that there are many historical factors that went into both creating the inclusionary housing program and of course what she's talking about which is separate but equal kind of access uh, that has a whole new twist in the situation where you're imagining maybe separate is better um, in, in, uh, for families that, uh, rather than buildings that, that, that are, are more engineered for uh, single people. And so um, Right, and so she's sort of left at that, that, that question of four doors. So what happened to me and and, and the uh, alluded to this is that I, I had this footage of her story and it was told all from her perspective. And so I went to gather other perspectives on what was happening uh, and I got fascinating, not contradictions, but very different uh, viewpoints on, on, on this woman in particular and in general about the, the problems with inclusionary housing 
The problem was that many people I talked to refused to go on camera. And so I was left in a very strange storytelling dilemma where you've got background information, uh, but you can't get anybody to say it on film. And so what I ended up doing is what's called a live documentary, um, where it's basically a mashup of Yesenia telling her story um, in sort of short episodes, two to three minutes, uh, and mixed in with live scenes, where we're sort of recreating on stage in, 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 in front of the film um, different viewpoints, both from the police that almost arrested them for sleeping in their car and could have taken away their, their kids, um, to the shelter where they stayed before they got into the NEMA building, uh, to the developers themselves. Uh, and so these scenes are sort of acted out to provide counterpoints to what uh, Yesenia is saying as she tells her story. Uh, but one of the most important characters is the guy who's sort of investigating the story himself. He's, he, he's, he's a side character. He doesn't take up that much time. We call him uh, Professor Key. Uh, but he has developed a sort of innovation, a technological innovation for these viewers. And he calls this innovation the Super Scope, and it, named after Super Tower. And so basically, we have these fictional elements built into the film. And the idea of the Super Scope is that it can sort of precisely look into the landscape and let you see some of the historical and, and sociological factors behind what's being built and, and this question of, of uh, inclusionary housing. Um, and you know, he explains all the gadgets and, and, and how it works. But again, in, in the show that lasts about an hour, he's a, he's a fairly minor character. Um, what's, the, the show itself uh, has gotten, it's been performed a couple of times in the last month in San Francisco. We've had sell out crowds. We've also had amazing Q&A. I mean, this is a film that sparks like an hour of Q&A where everybody wants to leave the room. Uh, and so I've, I've been pretty impressed with that. Um, but really our next step is to figure out, OK, now that we've got kind of a more solid story in a sense that's very landscape based, how are we going to create the mobile project? And this is still unformed, um, but we have done some experiments. And I would say that one thing that we do know is that this character, Pete, is going to be, in a sense, sort of the guide, that he's going to take this, this uh, technology that he's created for viewers at the top of Twin Peaks, and he's going to put them on your mobile device and let you look in deeper to this issue of equitable housing. And so one of the things um, that was incredibly important in, in how the, the mid-market neighborhood where Yesenia lives uh, and how it sort of got downtrodden in, in the 70s was the 15-year construction of the, of the subway system, which tore up the streets and literally like evacuated most of the businesses that were along uh, the blocks where she lives. And sort of to look back into that history, we're experimenting with both the mobile guide but installations a little bit like this uh, that are called, it's called um, Peephole Cinema. And uh, are we time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I won't show this, but I'll say that that's one of the things that we're uh, considering doing. Uh, and that there will be a series of these installations that are unlocked using codes that you get from the app. And that'll sort of be the basis of, of the mobile project that's in development now. Um, so, you know, basically we've learned three things that installations plus anchor media uh, it is, is really important. And when anchor media, I mean that kind of longer documentary. And then history applied to current issues. This, this has a lot more attention to it than any other project I've done. And also the idea that it is uh, a story that by its nature is grounded in the landscape. I'd say the last thing that we're really still thinking about is audience size. You know, will there be largest audiences for this? And I think there's a few things to keep an eye on, not just walking cinema's work, but detour.com is a platform uh, for walkable media that's based in San Francisco, but is quickly expanding internationally. I think they might build up a critical mass of audience for this. Disney and their theme park is also doing a lot to do rich cinematic storytelling on mobile. And then finally, uh, students. You know, I'm teaching a course now that is all about mobile narrative at the California College of Arts. And I do think that you know, academics are beginning to really warm up to this platform. And these people are really going to be, I think, the future of, of this platform. And they're fascinated with it. They really like being outside. And they love the idea that digital can be a sort of way to experience outdoors. Um, here's various links to things I've talked about. And uh, if, you, if you want, we can share this presentation and people can follow these links on their own. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Maggie. I'm with Doc Batters, and I'm a PhD candidate here at Brown. 
Um, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Shannon Carroll, an award-winning artist, visual storyteller, and creative entrepreneur based in Brooklyn. She's the creative director of Vivid Story, a studio that works with social enterprises, nonprofits, and brands to tell compelling stories that build authentic connections and inspire action. She also spearheaded Southside Stories, a site-specific audio walk featuring the residents of Williamsburg Southside community that seeks to reinvigorate a sense of discovery, wonder, and responsibility in participants' relationship with the city. Please welcome Shannon Carroll. I'm so excited to be here today um, and to share this project with you. Uh, thank you so much to Marissa for putting in such hard work and organizing this entire conference um, and everyone else that round. So just a little bit more about me. Um, I am primarily to myself as an artist. And my background really spans uh, interdisciplinary fine art, uh, documentary filmmaking, and community engagement. I've also created specific installations that really look at the construction of space and how people engage with those spaces, and then also the mediation of spaces, such as the Southside Stories audio walk. Um, so today my presentation will be um, completely focused on Southside Stories, and it's an audio walk into the Southside of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. First, I'll tell you a bit about the project, and then I'm going to be behind the scenes. So to help situate ourselves, um, here's a map of New York City. And of course, New York City is a massive place, as we all know. There's over 8.5 million uh, people who live there. And so I have uh, Brooklyn highlighted in blue. And then Williamsburg, the south side of Williamsburg, uh, is that blue target right there. So, walking the streets of the south side of Williamsburg, one bears witness to the neighborhood's sometimes violent past and struggles, but also to the strong sense of community and cultural pride that emerges. South Side Stories is an audio walk into the south side that features <coughs> along for residents from the community. Stories from the neighborhood's recent history as a predominantly Latino neighborhood are juxtaposed to a landscape that's rapidly undergoing transformation and synonymous with hipster culture. The experience encourages a reinvigorated sense of discovery and responsibility in participants' relationship with the city. Through the walk, 35 minute brief, participants unravel the stories of people and places. These stories from residents are peppered with instructions for the audience members to actually take off their headphones go into businesses and interact with the locals. The, the participants are given permission to go to places they may not normally. And the walk uses binaural audio that was recorded from throughout the neighborhood to create an immersive landscape that transforms the participant's sense of time and place. And binaural audio is a method of recording that uses two microphones that are arranged with the intention of creating a 3D uh, sensation of actually being in a place. And so we actually just use these $90 uh, binaural record, um, audio recorders that you just plug in, almost use like headphones, and just walk through the space in our reports as you're actually there. So to participate, you just download the free audio track from our website, southsidewalk.com, print out the map, and then go to the walk starting point in Lansburg. The walk starts in Bedford Ave, across the street from the L train subway entrance. Along the walk, you'll encounter a rich array of stories from the perspective of community gardeners, the owner of a closing bakery, a longtime realtor and landlord, his Hasidic uh, swimmers, the caretaker of an abandoned lot, a former drug lord, the founder of Free Rehabilitation Center, and much, much more. There's probably, I think there's over 20 different voices that we collected that have stories within the walk. Uh, and you know, these are people who are both witnesses to and active agents in the profound changes of the neighborhood that have happened over the past 30 years. Uh, for example, Robert, the Dominican landlord, um, he by people financially benefited from the increased real estate interest in the neighborhood. 
but simultaneously has painfully witnessed the displacement of his Dominican and Puerto Rican community. Here's a two and a half minute slideshow just to get a little taste of some of the stories. I realize that the only time you affect change is the change that's the closest to you that you can you know, make in your community. This is our neighborhood. This is where we grew up. People look at us and they and they, they look at us. Sometimes they look at you and I feel like a foreigner. Right. You know, and they don't realize that if it wasn't for the Spanish people that stood here, this wouldn't be a neighborhood. Because we stood here when it got bad. Okay? We, we're just Williamsburg people. We're from here. This is our neighborhood. I remember walking down, down this block, Bedford Avenue, and and I, I walk down the block and then come back up, and then realizing there is not one Spanish person that I saw while I was walking. There's not one. You know, I wish I had somebody to tell me, Angel, you know that block you sell, all those abandoned buildings, those little three-family houses? They were only going for $15,000 back then. <laughs> Today, they're worth a million dollars. I could have bought the whole block! about with this particular neighborhood is that you know within the past 30 years within a generation how drastic can has cha it have changed in that connection of identity to place and how one I mean creates you know their own like personal history um, how you know when the places change you know like how do you define yourself and how do you define your relationship to the neighborhood um, and so the walk ends at the final per remaining Puerto Rican social club in Williamsburg which there used to be many of. And this one is very special, it's called Caminos. Here's a one minute trailer that one of my uh, fellow collaborators made um, about the club. Um, the movie itself is a Caminos song, but this is just a one minute trailer. <laughs> and long-term residents about the neighborhood's past, present, and future. 
Partisan set an opportunity to see the neighborhood from a different perspective, walk in the shoes of another person, and ultimately empathize with their experiences. So now I'll tell you a bit about how I made the project, and then I also am gonna get some recommendations for those of you who are interested in creating powerful location-based experiences and potentially walking tours, audio-based walking tours. So um, in the fall of 2012, our team embarked on collaborative fellowships at Uni Docs, which is a center for documentary art in Williamsburg. As a part of a group of 12 fellows, we were assigned with creating works for Uni Docs' multi-year project, Living Los Torres. <coughs> the project uses the 1984 feature-length film, Los Torres, directed by Diego Tabria, as a starting point for investigations into the neighborhood of South Williamsburg. Here's a one minute promo video about the larger Living Los Torres project that this audio block was a part of. Across the East River from Manhattan lies a small community of some 20,000 Hispanic people, most of them Puerto Rican. It is the poorest section of New York City. This is a portrait of that neighborhood. They call this the south side because most of you are Hispanic, so they call it Hispanic. Los Sure. Los Sure is a tough. If you can survive Los Sure, you can survive anything. Talking about Los Sure, there's about a documentary that was done from 1984. documentary components, um, over 50 short documentaries that have been made, and then including this audio off. And I really uh, joined the docs because I felt like they rec recognized the history of the cinematic documentary tradition, while also supporting work that expands the definition of what documentary can be. Um, and I also, you know, just really felt, uh, looking at my own personal life of, you know, a childhood that was spent outdoors, to somehow being kind of cloistered uh, in front of screens and just feeling so much despair of my just gonna sit, you know, in front of the screen the rest of my life. And really wanting to get out, you know, into the neighborhood and to these places and getting people engaged uh, with these conversations that we're talking about within the cinema. Um, so here's just one minute about more about the Unit Docs project. Unit Docs is a center for documentary art that brings together a diverse community of artists, journalists, and critical thinkers on a search for urgent expressions of the human experience, practical perspectives on the world today, and compelling visions for the future. Each year, Union Doc selects 12 talented fellows from a competitive pool of international applicants to take part in a program we call the Union Doc's Collaborative Studio. Fellows attend private master classes and seminars with some of the most exciting voices in the documentary field and receive many benefits towards their professional development. For 10 months, from September through June, they commit about 20 hours per week to the program. They produce powerful, thought-provoking, non-fiction media. Union Knox guides the process, selects the theme for this work, and points the energy of the group towards an important mission. So, with the prompt of creating short projects about the south side of Williamsburg, my team set out to create an audio op that featured stories from the neighborhood's long-term residents. We looked at other New York-based audio work walking tours, like Past the Stranger, the East Village Poetry Walk by Peg Nolowski, <coughs> The Long Shot Hair by Janet Cardiff, and Sound Walk, the City of Williamsburg by the company Sound Walk. And we looked at these different projects and really analyzed you know, what we felt was successful about them um, and unsuccessful. And if you're not familiar with Janet Cardiff's work, she's created audio walking tours all across the globe, and she's just a really amazing uh, audio artist, she really looks at how to use sound to ad activate places and the stories behind those places. And 
you know, with uh, looking at these different Anju walks, like with the East Village Poetry Walk, um, we really love the use, it, it really looked at the history of, um, the, uh, of you know, different writers and poets um, who started their careers in the East Village of New York. Um, but, you know, it was very long, it was about an hour and a half. Um, we also felt like it was successful the way that uh, it used navigation through these very busy streets and really focusing on using, having the navigation to have a sense of poetry to it and a sense of suspense of how do you get the person to continue to walk to the next uh, location um, and how that's part of the narrative arc. Um, we love her long black hair because um, just going through Central Park, it was this amazing experience. I highly recommend doing it if you find yourself in Central Park soon. Um, and it was also made in 2004 and we did it you know, just a year or two ago, and it still resonated so deeply. Um, but we felt like it was a bit meandering in the way that there was a lot of connections, specific uh, references to where you were standing, but oftentimes, um, you know, the, the narrator would go off on these tangents and we become somewhat disconnected uh, from the space that you were actually in. Um, and then we loved the Hasidic Williamsburg sound walk because uh, for those you know, who are not part of the Hasidic community, it's pretty, um, you, it's very hard to access. And so it actually took you to these places where you felt like you shouldn't be. Um, and it gave you uh, direct um, encouragement or permission to actually go into these spaces that you otherwise would have no direct reason to. And so we were really motivated to take documentary out of the cinema and onto the streets and in public spaces. We took an ethnographic approach and spent a lot of time simply observing the streets, talking and interviewing residents deeply, hanging out. Then we plotted the most compelling route in narrative arts through the neighborhood, wrote the narration, recorded the binaural audio soundscapes, tested it many times, and edited together the final 35 minute audio track. In the process, we learned a lot about creating powerful location based media and designing for behavior. The audio stories themselves would be edited to be between, be between one to three minutes each. Um, and we did it because we really wanted to keep participants moving and to not be standing in one place for too long. Um, and we took, and the way that we did our interviewing, we took a lot of notes from This American Life. Specifically, we would uh, interview the, um, the story, like the people whose stories that we had in the walk. We would interview them on location and we would get ask them to describe the events step by step, get them to really show the story and not tell it. We would ask them to describe you know, what they were seeing, feeling, smelling, and experiencing at each location, provoke answers that were visual, um, and then have them call out specific references, details that were up and down, not just at eye level, and then have them repeat the stories until they made the visual references clear. And then after they told that story, ask a question that provoked reflection. And the stories themselves were really about, you know, these powerful moments that people had at these specific locations. And then lastly, um, we created a, a mobile responsive website that showcased the audio excerpts from the walk and made it easy to download the walk from a smartphone just on the street. And I was actually the one who maintained the website. Um, so I really believe that imagination is actually the most immersive medium. And the real magic of the walk is this juxtaposition between what you're seeing, hearing, and then what our minds can endure in that space. And I really believe that audio is a powerful method for stirring the imagination. Audio carries emotions and places in a way that visuals don't. So a few takeaways um, is that you know, Southside Stories really looks at generational memory and how uh, we create identity in relationship to a place and society. And the fabric of our society is knit together through our stories. Through a narrative, we can change our biases and make the invisible visible. Walking down the street becomes a real political act as we choose who to talk to and who to not make eye contact with, the kinds of businesses we choose to go into, or simply how we perceive others on the street. Perception is the production meeting of meaning, and the audio walk seeks to 
transform our perceptions. The audio walk itself ends with the story from author Henry Miller. He lived in the neighborhood as a boy in the early 20th century, when the neighborhood was a very different place. It was a densely populated working class district where the various ethnic groups that were Irish, German, Italian, Jewish, Polish lived elbow to elbow and constantly clashed. And you know, no neighborhood in New York City stays the same over a period of 60 years. So the real overall narrative of the walk seeks to broaden the scope of the neighborhood, that the neighborhood is not a stagnant reference point, but is, like I said, is constantly changing socially and politically, and that we are active agents in that change. And I love to you know what Preet was saying yesterday um, in her presentation about Los Angeles urban rangers, is that the city is always in a state of becoming, and it's yours to decide how to create it. And this walk certainly provokes that idea as well. So as a storyteller, you know, we can give permission to people, to people to go into places that they wouldn't otherwise. In designing the walk, we created the parameters for the experience and thoughtfully constructed opportunities for chance. The walk itself is not perfect, but one of the things I love about it is that no two people can have the same experience on the walk based on who they see and who they bump into and start a conversation with. I believe that audio and media has great potential in public spaces to produce understanding and empathy. As a form of healing and empowerment to imagine our ideal selves, to broaden <coughs> our perspectives, to create a sense of wonder, and to connect ourselves closer to our sense of place and others. Through these walks, we can increase our sense of presence and connection to the current moment. So a few uh, recommendations I also have is that uh, I found that one of the difficult points with um, location-based media is access to it, and obviously it's very hyper-local, but oftentimes just getting people to do the thing itself is probably um, one of the most difficult parts of it. And so a way to make sure that you have, that you're really meeting the audience that you want to do the project um, is to eventize it and to, you know, per, like premiere of the project at larger events, so you have, or a, a festival, so you have a definite cohort of people who are doing it. Um, and it also just helps to create a sense of momentum and also a sense of scarcity, like, oh, you know, I have to go to this because my friend's going to it and I won't have another chance. Um, you know, just think about ways how to give people incentive to participate. And also think entrepreneurially of you know, how, what problem are you solving through creating this project and choosing the medium? Um, and how is it really meeting the needs of the audience that you're trying to connect with? And think about really like what you know, most communication that your audience is using anyway, what is natural to them? And what is really the right platform? Because you know, perhaps you know, they don't use smartphones, maybe. <laughs> Like, this is something that would be completely inaccessible to them. And so you have to think about well, how are they communicating in the first place, and then what you can do to actually amplify that and choose the right platform to do so. And, you know, and I also just want to mention that, you know, we did think about using other devices, I mean, like, in terms of, you know, video or, like, using something that was more connected to visualizations on the smartphone, but we really made a decision early on that we wanted to use audio also because just to keep people looking up and not down at their devices. And we created as, uh, rather than as different like points of you know, audio triggers, we really wanted to have a singular kind of narrative experience that would take somebody through the neighborhood and have a kind of continued narrative arc through it. And then also, you know, through interactions, think about how you can reward that participation. Um, you know, once again, just give people incentive to participate. Um, and so, once, thank you so much for having me here, and I'm just so excited to speak again on the panel discussion uh, after this. And, you know, and I think that you know, these audio tours are just amazing ways to get people closely, more closely connected to their spaces, to get them out of their comfort zone. Um, and participating with others. And actually, I didn't even, um, I almost forgot that uh, when I was my undergrad, one of my, my boyfriends,
was completely obsessed with Jane Jacobs and the depth and life of American cities. Um, <laughs> and you know, would hold these uh, reading groups all the time. And I almost completely forgot actually how much that influenced um, you know, probably my this particular project, you know, until yesterday. And I think that you know, bringing back, you know, that central, um, you know, what her teachings were of creating these active um, spaces and these urban landscapes. You know, even through all these conversations about technology and what technology can do, of keeping like going back to that those premises and thinking about how we can really activate our cities and engage. Morgan Reed. Okay. I'm, I'm Marissa Brown um, with the Center for Public Humanities. Um, Morgan is the Executive Director of the Rhode Island Historical Society. Um, she has been for four years. She got her PhD in American Studies from Brown about 10 years ago um, and joined the Historical Society almost 11 years ago. Um, she won't be talking about her dissertation, but I love her topic, so I wanted to mention it. Um, she did her dissertation on the preservation and interpretation of prisons in the United States. Um, and she thinks she had two of her dissertation advisors are in the audience. So join me in welcoming Morgan, who will be talking about um, road tour and also her work at the Rhode Island Historical Society. Giving tours in various forms. 
The decisions that we make have an effect on not just our membership in the public, but also on our business model. And so this is something when we make a change that we have to take quite seriously. But one of the challenges that we had is our commitment to interpreting the past to the public um, was running up against some barriers. And some of them were technological, uh, and some of them were financial. And we needed to really sort that out. Because we are <laughs> committed to, as many of our partners in the audience are, to making history accessible to everyone, and to removing as many barriers to interaction with our historic landscape and our shared and collective past as possible. So how are we going to reinvigorate uh, our delivery models and our content to serve our publics better. One of the things that we are also very committed to as uh, the statewide historical society is collaboration and partnership. In fact, um, again, like one of my main partners here in the audience today, Newport Historical Society, who you'll be hearing from later this afternoon, collaboration and partnership isn't just something we like to do, it's in fact a strategic agenda that we have and it's part of our business model. So we seek out collaborations and we seek out partnerships when they make the most sense for delivering history. So in this era of when the flexible survive, we had to think about how, how do we do this and how do we do this in a way that actually increases our reach and increases our sustainability. So with that in mind, I want to back up a little bit and talk about some of the things that were pushing us to contemplate moving from our existing model. In addition to my work at the Historical Society, I'm also lucky enough to teach occasionally. Um, so I teach at University of Rhode Island and Rhode Island College in public history and teach Rhode Island history. And when I was teaching uh, at Rhode Island College recently, I asked my students to do uh, a brief examination of walking tour options in the city of Providence and then to pick another city globally to look at the various tour options and opportunities available to tourists and citizens in those cities. And I wanted to know at the end, where did they come down on it? Did they, want, did they think that docent-led tours were the way to go? Did they want a map, self-guided walking tour, an app? What do they want? What do they see working best? They had to interview their friends, their families, their roommates, and ask them as 20-year-olds, what it was that they were looking for. And the answer I got surprised me a little bit in that moment, though it really shouldn't have. The answer was they wanted all of it. They didn't want a docent-led tour. They didn't want an app. On Tuesday, they wanted an app. On Wednesday, they wanted a docent-led tour. On Wednesday evening, they wanted a self-guided map. And it's because we really do live in this moment where choice is an incredible part of how people interact with everything. So it might be that they want an app because they want to take a tour on a Sunday evening and none of them are offered. But they might be going on a date on Saturday and want just the map so they can have a private experience with the two people, but still one that's interactive and interpersonal between the two of them. And then the next week, they might have an assignment and want to go on a tour during the day and have somebody that they can ask questions to. So how do we, as a historical society, let alone ones much smaller than we are, how do we handle, with our staff size, our financial limitations, embedding that much choice in our repertoire? At the same time that we were exploring this with our students, we were also uh, working on a Mellon-funded project, which we call RODI, um, the Rhode Island History Online Directory Initiative, where we were mapping and doing a needs assessment of the history and heritage sector in Rhode Island. Now, um, you've probably heard Rhode Island is a small state, um, <laughs> quite, quite tiny in comparison to many others. Um, but it's not small in terms of the, the density with which we have history and heritage organizations. We have uh, 464 history organizations in Rhode Island, and those are simply the ones that are actual organizations, not just private clubs. These are ones that have some degree of collections that they share with the public. 
So this is uh, an incredibly dense historical landscape that we have. And many of them are quite small, and almost all of them, no matter what their size, are struggling financially with cataloging and getting intellectual control of their collections, let alone physical control in terms of their environment. And they're also very much struggling in this moment because in the heyday of the 80s and 90s with school visitation, they had incredibly, often incredibly close relationships with their local school systems. They had a lot of field trips, they had a lot of tours, um, they knew the teachers, teachers were at these schools for very long periods of time. And they have felt those relationships break down. A lot of this has to do with the decline in volunteerism, not because there are fewer volunteers, but because they're pulled in more directions. It has to do with uh, teachers spending less time in one place, so there's more mobility and less uh, and a shorter amount of time spent in any one school district. And of course, we all know about the limitations in terms of time that teachers have to spend doing any one subject, let alone take kids out of school, access to buses, all of that. And in Rhode Island, history, well, uh, it is taught in every school district. History, there is no mandated curriculum for history in Rhode Island. So any of the 39 districts can teach whatever history they choose at whichever time they choose to teach it. So in our more, most mobile districts of Providence, Pawtucket, and Central Falls, all clustered very closely together, you can move between 7th and 12th grade if you move in during the appropriate summer and never have American history from 7th through 12th grade. So these small sites are really struggling with how to connect and looking at some of the larger organizations in the state to find ways to put them back into touch with these K through 12 schools. We also work with a lot of teachers in classrooms. We got to know a lot of these teachers in new ways through the Teaching American History grant program. And what they keep asking for, and especially with Common Core, I'm sure all of you know, is access to primary documents. They are mandated to use primary documents, and history documents are an incredible way for them to, to get that into their classrooms. Um, so they're hungry for that content, but they need to find ways, again, that engage their students. These histories are not going to appear in any regular textbook, um, and the teachers are struggling with where to get good information. We also work with an increasing special needs community. It's one of our particular uh, programs at the Historical Society, especially at our Museum of Work and Culture, to work with uh, special needs K through 12 students, uh, especially around the autism spectrum, but also those with physical special needs, uh, visual impairment and hearing impairment. And that extends to our senior community, which is a huge uh, part of the, the users and participants. We know that the school teachers are having a hard time getting the time to bring their students to locations to do, say, a walking tour. But they're hungry for that content and that experience, and they're also really eager to find out what's in their local community. We know that families and individuals and classrooms that have special needs in particular are often looking for ways to go through materials that they can access without issues around mobility. Again, this is a challenge in historic museums. It's also a challenge on traditional walking tours. So we felt that at, we needed to start exploring other opportunities. We already had audio tours at our museum, so how could we think about our walking tours differently? At around the same time, uh, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities was funding a project through the John Nicholas Brown Center for the students who were working there, and with community, uh, community scholars, um, university scholars around different aspects of history and using the platform Curate Tape, which you'll hear much more about in, in a bit and, and hear much more eloquently from Mark uh, later, later today. Um, we're using this platform to share these uh, share stories that were not being covered uh, by traditional walking tours. Or and one of the things that it, this platform could do was that even though Rhode Island, is, as I mentioned, is, is quite small, um, you can't walk everywhere conveniently, so, um, so that 10 mile walk between sites was going to be a real problem for certain people. Um, so we were going to look at tours that are these stories that can go throughout an entire state 
but can be found discreetly as a tour on this location. So it's very important that we had a platform that could be accessed by any classroom, any individual, anyone who is seated at a desktop or laptop, a tablet, but also one that had an app translation to it. And CurateScape offered uh, that opportunity. So as, um, as the Council of the Humanities and the NDC were working on these projects, we got very interested because, of course, this is what we do. Um, we give tours, we have incredible information, and we know that our history and heritage constituents um, and our teachers are hungry for this information. So how could we come in? And, and thankfully, um, our, our partners, um, very traditional partners of the Council of Humanities and, and our neighbors at Brown welcomed us in, into this conversation about road tour. And we're now in the process of uh, figuring out how to best use this and how to add to these tours that already exist. So you already heard from um, Holly Ewell yesterday. And so um, as Holly had mentioned, they do this incredible uh, urban pond processional. Um, but they also turn this into a road tour so that it can exist all year round for people who are interested in learning about this pond. It's a great tool to share this message and get it out. It's also an incredible way, um, not to be mercenary about this, but to show funders what you're doing in a way that they can actually experience it and not have to wait for that event. One of the other ones, um, the one I wanted to highlight uh, today, Orphanages, Asylums, and Almshouses, was created, uh, curated by the Road Tour team, uh, largely through the work of uh, Professor Sandra Enos. And it is one of these tours where we could not do this as a walking tour. It is a statewide history and tells stories often of things that are no longer there. And so, uh, but it takes incredible advantage of what this platform affords. And that is ways in which we can still use a very traditional text-based narrative. So you can see we have sort of quotes from the 19th century. And this is about the state home and school. So anyone who is at the computer has access to this, to see all of this and this information about the site. You can also, it's pinned on the map, so you can go through through the map function as well. You can key in on images. Uh, this is Elizabeth Buffum Chase. Um, if you're doing any social welfare studies in the 19th century in Rhode Island, sure her picture will be there. Um, but it also allows us to embed audio and video functions. And this was really important to us because with a state, and I think it should be the new state motto, which is um, Rhode Island historically dense, um, with the density of organizations here and the material, people have been collecting for centuries um, the stories of, of individuals, events, and have been um, telling these stories again and again. And this platform allowed us to use archival materials from private collections, different, um, different organizations, uh, and, and do it in a way that's... Um, My mother had a nervous breakdown because there was no food, and this was the middle of the Depression, too. It was, everybody was poor. And uh, she had a nervous breakdown, so the state came and picked her up and took her to Howard, mm -hmm. the mental institution, and my father took off. And we didn't want to be there, because we remember we were kids. Yeah. We wanted to be home, even though there's not the land yeah. that's where you want to be. But now that I think about it now, I, I really think it saved my life. Wow. Because so you hear there's an excerpt uh, of Sandra's uh, interviews with grown uh, individuals who spent time as children in the state home and school. She had collected these years ago and put together a, a CD of this information. But here was a new way to share these edited audio clips of these experiences. It was also a way for us to embed video. On April 6, 2003, Rhode Island College held a special dedication honoring all the children who at one time spent part of their childhood at the State Home and School. In an aim to further preserve the history and legacy of the State Home and School, scholars hope to have the last remaining cottage act as a resource center for the study of child welfare. It was just nice to have some acknowledgement that somebody said, you know what, this is important enough for all the children who stayed there that we should do a dedication or a, or a memorial 
that made all the difference in the world to me. And I was able to just put that little piece of my life away. So it's, it's helping her feel. So this allows for a whole new life for this material that was collected for uh, scholarly programs, for work within a university, work done uh, within classrooms, and really does allow it to go into um, anyone's home, anyone's space. And you can, we're finding people who are looking at this before um, they would go and visit a certain location. It also allows us to complement existing tours. So we do our Benefit Street <coughs> tour, which is kind of our standard and most popular tour of the Historical Society. But doing uh, a Benefit Street tour through this kind of app allows for um, video, newspaper clips, audio, the kind of sound that we heard about in the last experience uh, the, that we heard about, um, uh, about New York. You can do that kind of work historically on Benefit Street in a way that also complicates the narrative and layers in the history of uh, gentrification, the history of communities that have been displaced, um, as well as uh, voices that are generally not able to be shared in a typical walking tour. So this allows us to um, use multimedia, use our archives better, give the sites around the state uh, a real handle on we know they want, they, they have a sense that they should be digitizing things, but the question is to why and to what end? And so this gives a real concrete way in which we can have a shared platform with a shared language that our users can learn this platform very well and learn how to, how to uh, anticipate what they're doing in that tour and also to allow sites to see how their collections can respond in conversation with the collections and stories of individuals, organizations uh, around the state as well. So we're very interested in how this can work together to bring various narratives and perspectives from all over the state into one platform to really um, complement each other in, in ways that our isolated walking tours haven't been able to before. So we're very excited about the ways in which we're, we're just learning about how to use this technology even better. We're starting to really try to embed better analytics into this process. Uh, we hear that that is coming even with the app uh, within the calendar years, the hope. So we can start to learn how people are using this on the ground and in their classrooms, in their homes. Um, we're also starting to, to learn about um, how to layer things better, how to tell stories um, in one location about different things. So what are the best practices about creating an arc, about how long people will stay in one place? How many people are using audio? How many people are using video? And then what are the challenges that we face? How do we, how do we teach people how to tell a story in a, in a good way um, that keeps people engaged? How do we have a style guide that allows people to retain their own voice, their own tone, their own individuality? So those are the things that we're working through. How do we, how do we include uh, multiple languages into these tours? So those are just some of the questions that we are addressing within our, our group right now as we seek to uh, develop this as a platform that more people in the state can use. But with any collaboration, there, is, there are these challenges. There's the challenge of a technology that we're that is changing as we're changing and growing, that we're struggling to understand at times. It's a challenge for organizations to give up degrees of autonomy. And you have to decide when you're ready to do that. If you just want to build your own um, app and you have the financial and staff means to do that, that's a wonderful thing. And, and so that's one choice that an organization can make. And you have a lot more autonomy with that and a lot more control over that. So, how do you as an organization get comfortable with the fact that you're working and truly collaborating with other organizations? But I think it's a, an incredibly important conversation to be having as if we truly seek to increase our use as historic sites and historic repositories, we need to find uh, those ways and those languages to reach as many people as possible. And for us, Road Tour is a way that we're hoping to do that. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Cortez and I'm currently a doctoral student in the Department of American Studies as well as a master's student in the Public uh, Humanities program here at Brown University. I will be introducing Dr. Monica Munoz Martinez. Dr. Martinez is an assistant professor of American Studies and Ethnic Studies at Brown University. 
She received her PhD from the American Studies Program at Yale University, where she co-founded the Public Humanities um, Initiative. Her research has been funded by the Mellon Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson National Foundation, the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Foundation, and the Texas, Historical, Texas State Historical Association. In addition to developing her manuscript, um, sorry, in addition to developing her manuscript, Inherited Loss, Reckoning with Anti-Mexican Violence, 1910 through the Present, she is also a Public Humanities <laughs> Fellow at the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage. Recently, her essay, Recuperating, His Recuperating Histories of Violence in the Americas, Vernacular History Making on the U.S.-Mexico Border, um, was the winner of the 2015 Constance Rourke Prize for the Best Article to appear in the 2014 issue of American Quarterly. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Monica Mendoza Martinez. Current conflicts in Texas public memory, 
And to do that, we're going to learn about two spaces in Texas where people learn Texas history outside of mainstream cultural institutions. I'm going to talk to you about, um, first, a Dairy Queen in a small rural town in Southville, Texas. And the second is a community <laughs> gathering in an even smaller rural community of Rock Springs, Texas. So uh, using screenshots of Google Maps here, you see Savnal is west of San Antonio, and it's, uh, it's, it's next to Rock Springs um, by Texas standards. Uh, well, so <laughs> let's think a little bit about Savnal. This is the Dairy Queen of Savnal. In Savnal, the Dairy Queen provides some of the only gathering spaces for residents outside of public schools and churches. The Dairy Queen, for example, offers more than just fast food gratification. It's a social space. Men gather for coffee in the morning, friends meet for ice cream, and athletic teams unload from school buses to fuel up after competitions. In the rural town short on cultural institutions, the Dairy Queen is also a community space of remembrance. Next to advertisements for Bellbuster cheeseburgers, Patrons can tour a photographic exhibit honoring the history of the Texas Rangers. And these are not the urban rangers or the forest rangers, but these are the Texas Rangers that were charged with uh, policing in Texas, or the state police force. The walls display photographs such as this one of companies of Texas Rangers that patrolled the area in the early 20th century. Aside from rangers, the common items in the photos include rifles, horses, and rangers themselves. During the recent trip, my encounter soon changed from genuine intrigue to shock as I noticed two photographs of mob violence. On a wall next to an advertisement, one of the images reveals seven men standing in front of a wooden shack with the printed words, ready for the hanging. While a second image shows the shack with a man suspended from the rickety roof by a rope tied around his neck. This is the photograph that I took very quickly because I didn't want to have questions about why I was being photographed, but you can see just the exit sign up above the end. So this is this is mounted right next to the exit sign in the, in the Dairy Queen. You also see the casual display of this image of violence uh, right next to the Mulatte uh, advertisement. And this is also right above uh, the trash can. So people who were going to discard their belt buster cheeseburger remnants or their uh, french fry containers uh, see this this exhibit raises questions about shared histories of violence and the glorification of state apparatuses popularly imagined to be founders of national and regional security. The Texas Rangers today remain celebrated in literature, television, uh, like The Lone Ranger and Walt Disney's Stranger Here, uh, and even in professional sports, uh, like the baseball franchise, The Texas Ranger, uh, formerly owned by W. <laughs> Despite this iconic status, the photographs of the Dairy Queen expose the tensions and contradictions embedded in Texas memory. For some residents, the Rangers invoke feelings of pride and nostalgia for frontier cowboys. But for others, they invoke fear and memories of social vulnerability to state-sanctioned violence. At a social vulnerability that, for some, are not as far removed as the dates labeled throughout the exhibit might suggest. The history of the Texas Rangers is preserved and presented through historical institutions such as the Museum of Texas Cultures in San Antonio, the Bullet Texas State History Museum in Boston, <coughs> and the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame and Museum in Waco, Texas. The Texas Ranger Hall of Fame actually uh, mounts and has portraits of some of the most, uh, some of the Texas Rangers who have the most uh, violent histories and records in the state for not only policing Mexican residents, but also for in the 19th century being the, um, the architects of genocide of Native and Indigenous communities. So there are multiple racial groups that look at these state agents and these icons of Texas history uh, with trouble. While some exhibits silence or subdue the role of racial violence in their narratives, others casually display images of racial violence without concern for the potential discomfort to some viewers. To the contrary, however, these displays have an intimidating effect and help make claims for belonging for some residents and the exclusion of others. For, from vernacular to state official exhibits, Texas museums in the 20th century failed to address history of racial violence within the progressive narratives they constructed. And so this is an effort of my role as a historian in pushing 
uh, state cultural institutions to participate in relooking at this history of racial violence. So now we're gonna move uh, from Sabell to Rock Spring, our second location located about 90 miles northwest. The natural beauty of the hill country was the backdrop for arguably the most well-known lynching of a Mexican national in the United States. In 1910, increasing racial suspicion of Mexican laborers arriving in town boiled over. When an Anglo woman was found brutally murdered outside of her home, local residents set the hills ablaze. On November 2nd, 1910, 40-year-old Effie Greer Henderson lay dead on her porch. The young mother was survived by her husband and their five children, and soon after the murder, a posse apprehended and arrested Mexican national Antonio Rodriguez, who crossed paths with the posse on a nearby ranch. That afternoon, a group of local residents removed the accused from his jail cell and marched him towards the end of town. The mob bound him to a barred mesquite tree. They saturated the heat with kerosene before setting it on fire. Competing histories of this case in Rock Spring are preserved in public memory in Southwest Texas and ingrained in the local landscape. At the Edwards County Cemetery, a, gra a, gra a granite tombstone reads, Antonio Rodriguez died November 3rd, 1910, burned at stake. Not more than 50 yards away stands a tombstone at the Henderson that reads, Mother, born July 20th, 1869, died November 2nd, 1910. Just as the gravestones of Antonio Rodriguez and Effie Greer Henderson remain in Rock Springs, so too do the memories of their murders. This act of mob aggression significantly added to Rock Springs' reputation as being one of the most racially hostile towns in Texas. And people remind, remain divided today as to whether the lynching was an act of justice or merely racism in action. These are photographs of the, um, the tree that's over the Rodriguez tomb, the grave, uh, this is a, an image of the grave as it is now in Edwards County. And close by is the gravestone for Effie Henderson. So memories of the lynchings were beyond newspaper accounts, consulate records, and historical narratives. And truly, this was a lynching of a Mexican national that left a huge mass of documents in its wake. There were consulate investigations into the, into the lynching. Uh, President Taft had to respond to what was happening in South Texas. Uh, students in Guadalajara uh, had protests of, uh, against uh, anti-Mexican violence in this period. So there really was a, a rich historical archive to look into this lynching. Uh, but for the most part, People in Rock Springs don't remember the diplomatic crisis, right? They remember and, and telling the story generationally from one generation to the next and have competing memories of this lynching itself. On November 4th, 2010, approximately 50 residents gathered to recognize the 100 year anniversary of the murder of Henderson and the lynching of Antonio Rodriguez. A group of Anglo and Mexican Americans convened at the Catholic Church in Rock Springs for a memorial service for Rodriguez. Later, residents moved to the cemetery for a candlelight vigil where the group prayed, sang, and surrounded the local priest as he blessed the grave for the departed. During the mass, the priest led the residents in a prayer for the souls of Rodriguez and Henderson, for both of their families, and for the persons who brought harm to them, and for the residents of the area to release any lingering grief. He ended his sermon by asking for God to give the residents of Rock Springs the strength to forgive and to heal. And this is a photograph of uh, the vigil as people were passing candles. These two here are um, the organizers who helped to, to get the memorialization off the ground. Um, this is a picture, another picture of uh, the sun sort of escaped the memorial. Uh, afterwards, uh, people gathered at a local community center and people were asked to bring uh, any sort of evidence they had on the lynching. And so people brought, uh, made copies of newspaper articles that they had kept, that families had preserved. Uh, they went to the county courthouse and made copies for everybody. And so this was a space, a seeable area where people would pick up uh, information and learn things about the history that they hadn't uh, learned before. So this memorial exposes memories of anti-Mexican violence that are embedded in the landscape 
It exposes the practices of community members in recalling histories of racial violence and signals the need to grapple with the long-lasting effects of the murder of an Anglo ranchwife and the lynching of a Mexican migrant labor. In the absence of judicial and diplomatic resolutions for the lynching, local residents have grappled with the reverberating impact of the event on social relations throughout the 20th century and well into the 21st century. The Rock Spring lynching, however, represents only a fraction of the acts of anti-Mexican violence. Um, and current federal and state police regimes uh, really have roots in this period of violence that need to be investigated. Um, but for residents in Texas, this history continues to be divisive. The period of anti-Mexican violence has, has become widely recognized amongst historians uh, as a period of ethnic cleansing in our history that is popularly forgotten. Books, lots of books have come to this conclusion, but popular memory has remained. And so one of the questions that I want to think about is how is it that public history can work to really change popular understandings of Texas history to, to reflect on this moment of violence? Um, and that's, there's some real obstacles to doing that work. But as the centennial has arrived, refusing to forget is a collaborative effort um, to mark this uh, centennial. And so we're collaborating uh, to memorialize, to reckon with this period of violence. Uh, the efforts will help to recover the contributions, not only of of victims, but actually look at early civil rights pioneers in Texas who protested these acts, um, and to really help reshape common understandings. Uh, and so public dialogue is something that we're working for. We're doing it in a series of ways. We've applied for Texas state historical markers uh, to designate some of these locations. Um, the uh, lynching of Antonio Rodriguez is one that we've submitted applications for twice, and have both been um, denied. Others, we have been successful uh, in terms of getting the applications and the markers approved. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about some of those dynamics uh, later in the talk. So, um, but there are two big questions that I would like to, to pose and think through with you. The first is, what does it mean to reflect on the long consequences of this period? Memorialization and creating public space for mourning loss is a needed part of this. This is something that can be done, however, outside of the state. And the, the residents of Rock Springs are really a great example of people who aren't waiting for state institutions <laughs> to say, we need to have a memorialization of this event. They did this work on their own. Uh, but for bringing about a full reckoning with this period of violence, it also requires the involvement of the state. State recognition, not only of this period of violence, but of the state's involvement in this history. So, Texas governors, Texas rangers, U.S. soldiers, and other state administrators who participated in calls for these acts of violence. To take the state, uh, to, to have the state take responsibility for past crimes means, ha means having the state institutions that play a role in shaping popular understandings of Texas history and take this period seriously. Towards this end, we're collaborating with the Texas Historical Commission and the Bob Bullock Texas State History Museum for a multi-year series of historical marker unveilings, public lectures, and an exhibit at the Bullock Museum in January 2016 that will then, if funds allow, for those who are new as granting institutions, uh, the exhibit will have another life as a traveling exhibit. The second big question, however, remains how to reshape common understandings of Texas history. The obstacles to this seem insurmountable for a few reasons. For one, since the early 20th century, politicians, the mainstream press, and state officials criminalized Mexican residents and called for their violent policing. And that, just that phrase, echoes today, and resonates today. The label Mexican bandit gave local vigilantes, police, state agents, and U.S. soldiers a license to kill at will. In my own research, I document how politicians, the media, and historians convinced broader publics that anti-Mexican violence should be remembered as a symbol of progress in a moment to celebrate. For them, more dead Mexican bodies near the border meant safer conditions for Anglo settlement, consumption, and capital. So efforts to control historical representations of this violence became critically important in state building efforts. And one of the best examples is what occurred after the start period of violence um, in 1919. In 1919, there was actually an, uh, an investigation into the actions of the Texas Public Rangers, uh, Texas Rangers, excuse me, 
for their role in orchestrating and participating in violence. Um, people were interviewed in front of a legislative committee. The transcripts of the investigation describe how this period of violence transformed the landscape of the border region. Testimonies recall the landscape littered with corpses. Testimonies of more than uh, 1,600 pages offered examples of police abuse and extra legal acts of violence at the state police. So this is actually, uh, the Texas State Archives have now digitized the investigation online. There's three volumes of these hundreds of pages uh, and a range of people were interviewed. And this is a, a new historical resource um, that's now being widely available for people to uh, study and interact with. Despite the findings of witness testimonies, the investigation did not shift the culture of impunity. To the contrary, during the investigation, commissioners and some witnesses defended racial <coughs> abuse and supported brutal methods of policing. The proceedings did not change the procedures of the state agency, nor did it lead to the prosecution of any rangers that were shown to have committed murders or participated in terror. In the wake of the 1919 state investigation, the state administration took a series of steps to ensure that the widespread use of extra legal violence by agents and the efforts by state administrators to cover these crimes would not undermine the state authority. The state actively moved to erase the atrocities from public dialogue. The first step in this process uh, was actually sealing the records of this investigation. And so the testimonies and records of state sanctioned brutality and horror were filed away in state archives. Historians and state institutions would do better than that. They would make a popular historical narrative that erased, that did not erase the, this period of violence, but instead venerated the agents for bringing Texas to a state of modernity. Their violent policing practices with 44 revolvers in hand would be celebrated and immortalized as the embodiment of Texas masculinity and pride. One Texan, however, had access to the investigation. State archivists allowed a historian of the University of Texas at Austin, Walter Prescott Webb, access and unlimited access to their investigation and to their archives. He wrote and published the book, The Texas Rangers, A Century of Frontier De Defense. And I, I want to speak to you for a moment about Walter Prescott Webb, not only because he's a historian who helped to write this narrative, but he was somebody who did the public work of the public communities. He not only wrote and participated in the academy, uh, and published research, but he was a pioneer in making sure that his narratives were then circulated and marked the landscape through memorials and um, public history. So let's think about his culture of authority. He was a member of the UT Austin History Department for over 40 years. He was the director of the Texas Historical Association for seven years. He served one term as president of the American Historical Association. And he also received two Guggenheim fellowships, not one but two, and a Ford fellowship, among others. So selecting Webb to have full access to the records, the state institution left the Texas Ranger legacy to a well-trusted and well-respected guardian. This is, um, this is his uh, photograph from him at the time that he was often a history professor. This is my favorite picture of him because he looks so tenacious. So. Um, but this is, <laughs> we'll go back to this one. Uh, so in terms of his work, he had a long legacy in, in, in the publication of his, his Ode to the Texas Rangers uh, coincided with the centennial of the Texas Revolution, the 100th year the anniversary of Texas's independence from Mexico. The state allocated more than $3 million of state funds for the construction and the placing of markers, memorials, and buildings. And they commissioned the construction of monuments to honor the early patriots of the state. But they also funded the, purchase, the, funded the purchase of land for celebrations, uh, for state pageants, and for expositions. And so in total, the state placed over 1,000 exposition buildings, memorial museums, statues, and markers around the state. And that's what helped to imprint his version of the history of violence that I'm describing to you across the state. These are um, photographs of the Texas Centennial. Uh, of advertisement, promotional material uh, for the actual celebrations in Dallas. Um, these are some photographs of some of the memorials that were unveiled in different parts of Texas. And this was, these were uh, miniature souvenirs of cotton bales. Um, so they also celebrated the, uh, the, the agriculture of Texas, not just um, 
some of their favorite icons. Also going to move through to show you um, that children were encouraged to participate in the celebration of the Texas Rangers. Uh, they too learned the Texas the lessons of the Texas Rangers and the Texas history. Um, and you know, I'll take you now to to thinking about the historical markers in Texas that now exist that in many ways mirror this uh, narrative uh, that justifies the racial violence that occurred in the 19th century uh, and the early 20th century. And um, this, is a, this is a historical marker that was um, directed in 1970 outside a small town in Valley, close to Savannah and to Rock Springs. And it's an example of a marker that uh, it's called the Chalk Bluff Indian Massacre. And the marker itself marks um, violence at the hands of indigenous groups against Anglo settlers. And so this is one of these markers that continues um, to call for the militarization and policing of indigenous groups. And so it's an example of one kind of history of violence that is directed in Texas. Uh, and you can also see uh, from a close up uh, what some people have thought of this representation of the history of Texas. Uh, you see some gunshots, um, some profanity. And you know, I show this um, to help people think about the reality that in places like Texas, Texas Historical Commissions are not seen as allies. Uh, they are seen as racist institutions. And so there's a real urgency behind the work that we're doing, not only to make sure that these historical commissions or that museums uh, attend to these histories, but also that they start to repair relationships with huge demographics of people in the state of Texas, right? Texas is not, uh, will soon be a minority majority state. In many of the counties, uh, like in Edwards County, they are minority majority counties. And so when we think about the audiences of public history, if we don't start to repair relationships with uh, communities that are diverse in these states, uh, there will be a, you know, a missed opportunity that the audiences will continue to shrink uh, as population and demographic changes emerge. So I, um, so th this is, uh, I'm going to just end by showing you some of the work that I've been doing students just very briefly uh, to, to start mapping these events of violence, recognizing that, that collaborating with state institutions is very slow. We found excellent art, uh, allies in the Texas Historical Commission and also in the Bullock Museum. Um, but in terms of making some of this work accessible, uh, we're, we're exploring how to visualize not only uh, the lit, the the, uh, a database of these events of racial violence, uh, but then also thinking through the possibility for uh, creating curated tours, recognizing that, um, that this uh, map and others like it would be helpful for researchers who want to research this history, uh, but for people who just stumble upon it, we want people to, to, to take with them curated information about histories of violence and recognizing that these are sensitive that need to be packaged uh, in ways that are accessible not only to, to adults but also to children so they can be used in higher education. So I'm, I'm going to, to end there because my timer is, is out just barely uh, and, and look forward to the conversation with my colleagues who uh, have exceptional ideas for the best ways to use the digital uh, <coughs> tours that we've been discussing. Okay, thank you. Welcome back. Hope your bellies are full and uh, you're ready to sit and listen and ask questions. Hyper-caffeinated questions at that. Uh, so, once again, just a round of applause again for this incredible panel. Uh, and I, I think there's so much to talk about and so, so much diversity in terms of what we've really discussed here today that I want to make sure we leave ample time for questions from all of you. Um, because there's a number of different angles I think that this really intersects with the conference and also with a lot of the work that we wind up doing in our own professions. But I want to leave with one quick question that I want to open up to the entire panel, so answer however you'd like. And it's one that I've been both concerned about uh, professionally, both as a funder and as a, uh, a scholar, designer, whatever you want to call uh, what I do, and also one that I think I feel, and what I've seen on Twitter, um, at least during the midst of this panel, has really been concerned about as well. And that's the question of audience evaluation and impact 
and what you potentially learned about your audiences in the midst of doing these projects, and really the question of how you measure impact at the end. You know, is it about sheer numbers? Is it about depth of contact? Is it about spending a certain amount of time at a, at a particular location? Is it about getting in the boat, so to speak? Or are there other ways of looking at impact here and awareness? So I want to open that up to the group. And anyone feel free. Or I'll just look at you and call on you in my old professorial way. <laughs> I, I'll start. I mean, I have a couple of ways of measuring audience that are pretty traditional. One is, you know, when you have an app in the store, you're able to look at downloads, not just your numbers, but you're able to see geographies of download. And I very quickly realized that we were getting downloads from like Romania and Japan, and many of these people probably weren't coming to do the on-site narrative. So I realized that with many of these mobile documentary projects, there's definitely going to be an online audience. Uh, for it, and so, you know, um, I had started off more audio focused and that made me realize that, hey, if we can have a video component where some of it's easier to share over the web, and I think video is a little easier than, than audio to, to pass around, that that would behoove, you know, having a larger online audience. And then the second thing we did is uh, more qualitative uh, audience testing where we actually shadowed people uh, taking these walks and took notes on what their experience was like afterwards uh, via interviews. Uh, and that, that, was, that was great. Um, the other, I'd say the third component that might be been the most important is that concierge that you saw. The people who are like the permanent parts of your exhibit on the ground. And they'll report on A, numbers that are, get, that are coming, but also B, what it means to them. You know, what it means to be able to have this kind of like, in the concierge's case, this kind of very intimate connection to both the neighborhood and the history. And sort of the pride that he felt that he was part of, of that performance uh, was I think another way that we got we got data on, on the audience. Okay, and for me, you know, when I'm also giving advice to other people about making these types of projects, I really always recommend to first look at who your audience is, um, you know, and then the goals that you have for that audience. And thinking about, you know, what does that impact really need to you, and how will your project be successful based on the goals that you have for the audience that you are really focusing on. Um, and so for us, you know, we really, the whole gist of this project was creating a difference in perspective, and also uh, just getting people to really look at how the relationship with the city is, and how what kind of power that they have over that. And so that is very much more of a qualitative impact that we really wanted than a quantitative impact. Um, and so that was really our central focus. And our feedback from the walk has been overwhelmingly positive for those who have done it. Um, so that's really like our, <laughs> I guess, summary of that. And then for the people who um, are actually located on the ground or just kind of have access to the neighborhood, we um, created a website where you can listen to different audio excerpts. Um, and so that's also how we reach those people who are not in the neighborhood itself. I'm also, I'm really taking notes on, on the um, presentations that I saw that where people have built in feedback and, and people surveying um, mm -hmm. the users as they're using the device. I think that's ingenious. I think the Lone Rangers also took that model, like the Lone Rangers, uh, <laughs> the Urban Rangers with their, uh, with their student projects which is you know, to take hold of the momentum and, and get the information soon and quick. Um, for, for our public project, uh, you know, we're still at the, the, the exhibit hasn't been unveiled yet. It will be in January 2016, but there's a big buzz in Texas. Um, there are, you know, we're getting media coverage and because of the uh, tensions in Texas surrounding this history, we were very apprehensive and actually the people who have been reaching out um, from all different ranges of, of Texas residents um, have actually been reaching out with more information. And so um, uh, we've been able to, to conduct more interviews with people who have information of this, of this history. Uh, people have donated um, for the exhibit their uh, objects from their personal and private archives um, of their family histories. And, and these are people from all walks of, of Texas history and all walks of this side of history. So, so it's been, uh, so what we're actually doing with the Bullock um, and as a group is, is building in these mechanisms um, in our social media interactions, but also uh, for the museum exhibit itself, 
um, to offer opportunities to, for people to volunteer, to be interviewed, and to tell their stories. And so uh, thinking about the centennial as not being a sort of closing to the story, but uh, actually an opening up of the public dialogue. Um, so, so that's where I'll leave it there, and I'll let you know <laughs> how things go in January with the unveiling. Can I just ask just something about that? Because you're at an actually really interesting stage in terms of impact and how you foresee it down the line, because impact and our, you know, our measurements of it evolve and change as a project goes on. But what is your goal at this point? I mean, is it awareness? Is it participation? Is it engagement? Is it really curating those communal histories? And, and, and so on. It's, it's all of those things, and it's also um, to collaborate with families who have been trying to tell these histories for generations. And so in, for example, the, you know, the efforts to get the Texas Historical Commission to mark some of these histories, uh, the lynching is one that has not been remembered. Another um, that I wrote about in this article that received an award, it's a bittersweet award because on the one hand, more people are reading about this, this a double murder that occurred in Hidalgo County. Um, on September 27th, 1915. Uh, so the, the centennial of this um, tragedy occurred this weekend, and we will, instead of planning the unveiling of the historical marker to, to actually reckon with that history, uh, we're, I'm having to explain to the families why we have to submit the marker application again. And so there is you know, this sort of moment of reflection where uh, the, the, the conversations and the dialogues are occurring, but there's a lot of work that has to be done. And if you think about places like the Dairy Queen and Sabinal, uh, there's a, a broader context for the importance of these dialogues uh, to continue. Thank you. I guess I'll go back to the more mundane uh, <laughs> issue of evaluation. And, and for us, I, I think there are, each piece on the steering committee of we have you know, three quite different organizations, and then within that, each tour, we've had different uh, creators of those tours. So there are different uh, projects that have different particular measures that they're interested in. So it is a challenge, but I would say, in reflecting on for the historical science perspective, there are certain measurements that we're going to be able to find with increased use of analytics. So those same things that you're talking about in terms of how many downloads are we getting? What are the demographics of the people using them? What's the difference in those between who's using the app versus who's using the desktop version uh, of, of our road tour? So we are, are very interested about how it's being used as a tool. But above and beyond that, I think there uh, will be pieces of this as we begin to think about how classrooms are using it. So that will be a more traditional sort of uh, question and answer, luckily, with the incredible kind of connections with teachers that we already have of asking, how are you using it? And doing uh, a bit of sort of longitudinal evaluation about um, early adopters and then how it is used going forward as more things are added to the site. Um, so I think there will be different evaluation markers in the beginning as we try to get people interested in using it and then to follow how they're using it. Um, and that's what, what we're really interested in, uh, to try to understand then questions like um, how many folks are using this and then going to a historic site. So who is looking at it and then going? Who's looking at it then taking an in-person tour? How are we using this sort of the, the hybridity or the kind of analog and uh, digital at the same time? So how are people using both? So we are also looking at, as we move forward, using TurateScape, using some of the tools that we can add in to increase comments. So um, we were looking at uh, Discus yesterday to uh, use a platform that allows us to get, we looked at one example yesterday where people took a, a tour of their community and then added in their own photographs into the comment section and said, this is my family doing that. And so that's another way I think that all of us are interested in measuring the utility of this tool and that is to collect those histories that are not yet in the hands of sort of public repositories. What's out there? What are those hidden collections that we can start helping to identify and connect people more deeply with the his their family history being a regional history and a national and international history. So I think that as many audiences as we have, we have ways that we're interested in measuring and it's really gonna be a project by project um, tweaking of that measurement um, that we look at. Thank you. And just one quick related question too that, that I think also was uh, was asked before, you know, during the conversation. And I think it's worth asking in this context as well. In terms of, 
building awareness for your project and actually getting it in the hands of the audience that you want to. What are some strategies? What are lessons learned here? Because in an increasingly crowded media landscape, an increasingly crowded digital humanities landscape, it's no longer enough to say we're going to deliver the outcome. So in what ways are you attempting to use outreach and use the, the project as a way of really building audiences and also finding audiences? Social media for Steve Lubar, <laughs> who has all of the Masters of Public Humanities students uh, develop a, a social media profile, and that for this project has been what has helped to garner a lot of interest and excitement. And actually, families that have reached out to the project have reached out to us through Facebook, um, and also after newspaper articles that have covered this history or have covered the, the efforts have been published locally in Austin or in San Antonio, um, it's helped people to connect with the website to find more information. And so in figuring out that people are actually clicking on the bibliography to find more information, um, bringing in other historians and other uh, cultural institutions to, to guest blog on the website has been really a great way to build alliances, but also to build momentum. But I could not have anticipated that somebody who was in their 60s or 70s would be contacting, refusing to forget through Facebook. Uh, that's how they keep in touch, I guess, their grandchildren, <laughs> and so they're on it. But people are very active in in, in contacting the group in that way, which is exciting. Right, and I also think it's really important to think about how you're meeting your audience on the ground, and how you know for these very specific location-based projects, you're actually gaining awareness and activating their interests. I mean, there's many different like physical ways to do that. Whereas, you know, if you're actually in a public space, you can get some sort of permit to have a sign. Oftentimes, actually, I recommend going through the arts councils, um, and they can support you as an artist. Um, and oftentimes, like, you know, the New York City subway, like, they'll support artists to have, you know, certain posters up um, or certain ads. And I mean, and this is also quite difficult because you're also then contesting with all of the commercial advertisements that are also everywhere. And so really trying to get some sort of more formalized support uh, through councils is a good way to get some sort of pla plaque up or some sort of you know, su semi-permanent sign um, at those locations. And then I also just recommend, as I said during my presentation, to think about what events or like formal <laughs> conferences or festivals that you can uh, adhere your project to because that will have a very focused audience that can um, do your project. And it also, there's also, there's a built-in audience, essentially, so. So I, I think a couple of things are important for the projects that I do. One is this idea of an anchor media piece. Uh, and in the case of the inclusionary housing project, it's a, a film slash performance. Uh, I would say that, you know, so that people have access to something that first is more traditional, they can watch it online or on TV even, uh, and then they can have this kind of mobile extension from it. Um, the other component I think that's really important is making history topical. You know, the fact that I'm doing a project now that ties into issues that are gonna be voted on in a couple of months in San Francisco, it's something that's already got a lot of press and energy behind it, tends to bring in people naturally by, by virtue of its of its content. Um, and, the, and then the other thing I'd say is partnerships. You know, it's been incredibly key uh, to have um, certain, you know, businesses in the area where the story is set actively recruiting people to come to performances, hosting performances, uh, getting public uh, stations like KQED and larger media channels interested in, in putting the content out there. Um, and then the last thing that I'd say is that there are certain pitfalls, you know, that I do think if you're especially talking about location-based media, A, we thought that those markers that we put up around Gloucester were going to get downloads, and we've seen zero evidence of that. And so this idea that, you know, people are going to scan a QR code, and that there's going to be somebody who's just wandering is going to, like, step into your story, no, that's not going to happen. It's going to be more by appointment. I think people are going to download and then jump, in, jump into the story, at least that's the evidence we've seen from Gloucester. The second thing is that um, I do think that there's this idea too that like, oh, if I get you know, a mention of a mobile project on you know, a TV or a radio announcement, that that's also gonna lead to audience. And there's been very little evidence of that too because you think about it, somebody has to write down the URL, or remember it, then download it, then go to the place. 
And so, you know, that's why I think it's really important uh, that we have organizations like Detour.com, which is a for-profit business that is massively marketing and massively creating a new practice, which is to get out into the world and explore. And Disney, in its own right, I mean, they're not necessarily doing historic content, but they're creating that practice in their theme parks where people are beginning to expect that they can get rich media on their phone that immerses them in places. Yeah, and I think that's really important to think about why do people go out to events in the first place and what actually draws you. Um, and oftentimes it's because a friend will be there and because someone you know is like really encouraging your participation, like getting out of your house and actually going somewhere to do something. Um, and so, you know, I think that as, you know, I was talking about, you know, the importance of science, but I also think that like QR codes are greatly overrated in terms of like encouraging participations. Most people just ignore flyers on the streets. So, and so you have to. Business today we have QR codes down. <laughs> and Rhode Island history is. Wait, what is it? We're very dense. We're historically dense. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think mine went the opposite. So, go ahead. Yeah, but that was basically. I, you know, we're in um, the early stages of this. We were uh, talking to each other a lot yesterday about. Uh, what we want to do to actually get the word out. So this has been an incredibly well-timed conference and conversations for us to be participating at a point where we have put a lot of content into what we have so far and developed a lot of content that's not up yet um, as we're working on this. Uh, the nice thing though I think about the project in general because it is based in partnerships is that each of our organizations, in addition to each of the people who created the tours, have built-in audiences. Um, that we will be asking folks to, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, exploit, utilize, um, <laughs> send things out to, um, so that they can share and get that information out to them. So I think uh, a combination of social media, which we, all of our organizations do, um, uh, sending things out to our memberships, um, but sending things out to these, these audiences. Uh, it's very helpful in the partnerships, and this is why we're doing this. And the hope is, and the inspiration here is for people to see what we're doing and to say, we have stories to share, choosing a platform that can, is expandable, easy to comprehend, um, and they can say, you know, and, and now I have an idea, how can we work with you to do one of our own? So it's very important to us that we're getting it out broadly, and, and for us, as we talked about, um, partnership, not just with other historical organizations, but with other agencies, other types of organizations, um, independent scholars, um, and, and as we talk about citizen scholars, people throughout the state who do this work and have tremendous collections on their own, um, we hope that they come back and they're actually producing content. And so it's a dialogue with them. Um, so, so partnerships are kind of key. And, and I think partnerships also is something that we've been really thinking about in the, the creation of of curated tours and curated content or uh, teaching modules is the accessibility of the content for educators and making sure that educators are helping us to shape uh, content as we're exploring it um, and then in the upcoming months. Um, because, I mean, in a place like Texas, you have um, state mandated, you know, Texas history classes that students are taking. And so uh, the goal is not just to create the content, but then make it available for people to use it and to be cognizant of the uh, burdens on K-12 public educators that are very real in terms of resources, but also in terms of the standards in which they have to teach to um, in, a, in a testing society, right? Making things easy that teachers don't have to learn how to navigate websites or uh, how to, you know, thinking about digital IQ is really something that I'm thinking about. If my parents can't navigate um, a tour, then it's, a good, then it's not gonna work um, for public audiences. So I think you know, constantly thinking about the different sort of registers of how to make it accessible and usable um, is something that is sort of at the forefront of our development efforts. Yeah, and I just want to add, as you know, people are thinking about creating their projects, um, really think about how you're disseminating and connecting to your audience and really marketing your project um, and thinking about how that actually fits into the resources that you have. Um, both financially and you know the people who are involved, um, because once again it's just really about like focusing on who is your audience and then how do you reach them and how do you get them out and like doing your um, tour in the public space. Um, and if you don't have enough resources to reach them, you have to really think about how who you can partner with um, or what can you do to actually you know, bring them out. Thanks. Let's uh, let's open this up to questions from the audience. 
And we have our first over there, I believe. Um, so I, I had a question, a general question to everyone about um, what the sort of long-term preservation plans of the, the content um, that you're, you're gathering um, is what the afterlife of, of some of this um, content, you know, whether it's audio or video um, or, or data about things is, or do you um, tend to focus more on just the present and um, the you know, current forms of engagement? Like how, how much of a role should, this is a digital archivist uh, question, um, should considering preservation uh, factor into, into these sorts of projects? For us, uh, at this point, I mean, it's um, it, an interesting question and one we're, we're talking a lot about because what we're dealing with it, even more broadly than that and more basically than that is issues around ownership of when multiple people are participating, organizations, individuals are writing and producing content, who owns certain things, and, and in the case of, and for us, um, if a, a scholar or an organization, most of these digital audio things are not have not been produced just for this project. Road Tour is uh, a platform that is sharing those things, so those are owned by other repositories and other uh, individuals already. So that I think that um, the issue is not that this is produced content for Road Tour, but rather repurposed content that's already in other repositories. So for us, we haven't yet kind of got to the point about what is the longevity of this because we don't own that. So we got, we're not as, as worried about that. So, so I have two things to say about that. Like one is the fact that a lot of our projects are based on video, it makes it much easier to archive components of the experience. Um, that said, to maintain apps going in both the Google Play Store and the iTunes App Store requires maintenance. It's not a ton of maintenance, especially because we have a fairly simple platform, but for the Gloucester Tour, we had to do a pretty major update uh, to make it work on newer devices. And so that's, that's just part of that beast, is it's gotta, it's gotta be maintained. I, I would say too that that um, tour that we did with, in, in Boston has been running continuously for six years. And so none of our partners wanted to remove the installations. They still have the installations. That does also require a bit of maintenance, but they're small and simple. Uh, and so that, that to me is something I didn't expect, that the partners, we thought it would run for six months and it's been six years. Uh, can I just add, add to that in terms of use of the platform and that kind of maintenance? It was one of the reasons I think we decided to go with something that we didn't create ourselves, but rather um, a, a platform that would be maintained mm -hmm. by another, by Curatescape. And so that um, we weren't in the position of having to manage the technological updates ourselves when none of us are the tech side of that. And so it made sense for us to partner with someone who was going, to, a company that was going to do that. So there are fees associated with doing that, but ones that we felt were, were the most useful for maintaining the longevity of the project. So I really think that you should think about um, you know, what is the lifespan of your project and how long you need it to be relevant for to meet your goals you know, for your audience. And so um, you know, for us, the actual 35 minute audio walk has been uploaded, uploaded to um, SoundCloud. But you know, who, with that, you're kind of giving your power over to SoundCloud. And what if SoundCloud suddenly decides to shut down? I mean, that has happened you know, with previous like digital platforms, whereas you know, all of a sudden, like people will just completely lose their projects because they're interesting, you know, in these digital companies. Um, and so, you know, we also have a website that I pay for the hosting for, and um, you know, and I'll, it's just as long as I, you know, want, you know, to spend that money. Um, but as well, like I sort of created the project. You know, I could have decided that, oh, I really just want this project relevant, you know, for maybe a few weekends where I really try to get people out and like doing this audio tour. Um, but I was kind of enamored with this idea, especially since my audio walk was really about time and about the progression of time and how we relate to time and space. And so I was actually quite enamored with Janet Cardiff's uh, Her Long Black Hair in Central Park, which was made in 2004. And I did, you know, almost a decade later, and it still worked, <laughs> and it still like carried like such, you know, grace and magic with it. Um, and so I also 
wanted to kind of have, I created the audio walk, um, South Side Stories, you know, hoping that you know, people can still do it in a few years, it can still be relevant or applicable in some ways. But, you know, that also takes a lot of maintenance and you just really have to plan in like, how much dedication you are keeping towards it and those resources that you can to keep the project updated. And then also, when you decide that the project is done, <laughs> whereas I think that's a huge problem, not just in um, audio-based tours, but all like in digital-based projects, um, and especially like web-based projects, uh, you know, how you will keep that so people can still reference it, but it's still, you know, the archive is still alive in some way. Good questions. Uh, your point about the, the, the lifespan is very, very interesting. Uh, what you're talking about seems almost analogous to the distinction between sort of changing exhibitions and museums and how you effectively interpret the permanent collection. And while these projects are great, they're they're obviously costly, demanding, and, and, and can be high maintenance. And to me, I think the, the great need is, is for long-term interpretation of places that people care about, you know, so that if you're going to Newport I'm, or to anywhere, Providence, uh, what kind of apparatus works in a long-term way that, so that the cost of, of, of implementing an interpretation can be you know, kind of uh, 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 absorbed over many, many years. I like the idea that the project was six years, and, and, and but then when you say QR codes are dying and SoundCloud might not be there, I worry. <laughs> Any responses to that? One response is that the most successful audio guide uh, by far is the Alcatraz audio tour. And it survived, I think, three iterations of different platforms. It was first delivered on cassette tape. Uh, and then it was delivered uh, on these kind of rental devices. And now you can get it on your phone. Uh, and so, I, you know, the big thing to get to your point about its important sites being able to develop something that lasts for years, uh, to me, is that the content was fascinating. It was very, very well produced, and that kept it there. Nobody wanted to see it go away as these new platforms went on because it was original interviews with prisoners and guards. The second thing is that they actually retrofitted the prison itself with a walking path and with installations in specific cells that also became a part of the site. And so I think that in tandem, the content, the installations, and, and it makes these things have a much stronger life of their own. I mean, I, I think that, I, and, and I don't mean this to be terse at all, I mean, but the, the best longevity, um, the best thing that we can do to make sure that whatever uh, tool we're using to <coughs> deliver them happens is preserve and protect your collections mm -hmm. and your museums and your historic sites. And those are the things that have been there and will be there. Um, as if we maintain them and we care for them, and the tools are going to keep changing, and the ways that people want to and need to interact with them are going to keep changing. And I think it's very important for us to stay um, engaged in the changing landscape of how we use and people want to experience those things, but if we lose sight of the caring for the collections and the buildings and the actual history, then we lose our ability to use whatever platforms come about. And so uh, for many of us who are in the history business in a way, it's how do we balance the time of our staff and the time of our, and the amount of our resources on caring for the physical, caring for the actual uh, object and the people in front of us um, and delivering them in different ways. So I think we just have to make sure we're maintaining both at all times. Um, to be able to make sure there's a landscape for us to have fun with, um, with these different kinds of platforms. One over here, one over here. Last two questions, we'll do two more. I'm just wondering, for these projects that have uh, publics, oh, sure, I'm Chad Randall from Cornell University. I have a question about the way that um, you accommodate or address the issue of public safety in projects where you've got uh, audiences going out 
public's going out and looking at apps, putting on headphones and so on, often in crowded environments full of traffic and so on. Is this an issue? Li is liability an issue with any of these projects? And have you dealt with this in any way? Lawyers. <laughs> the question is lawyers. So, <laughs> so I'll just go first. Um, I haven't dealt with any specific legal uh, ramifications from our audio walk, which takes place in a very busy urban environment where you're, con you know, uh, the urban walker is contesting with bicycles, you know, with uh, cars, and there's so many different street stops um, throughout the walk itself. So, um, no, I haven't had to deal with any kind of like legal liabilities in a formal way. Um, you know, I haven't had, you know, participants don't sign an agreement that, um, you know, they will not sue us. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, when I was making the walk, um, I was very cognizant of how do I adapt the walk um, in a way where it keeps the narrative arc engaged to the, the um, actual, uh, you know, project itself or the actual like doing um, of the project itself, um, but also how to really create um, these kind of navigation cues and tools that are integrated with the narrative arc, but also keep in mind like the actual like having to be safe and like look across the street. And we just did a lot of testing um, of the walk itself before we put it out to the public of making sure that the walk was appropriately timed, that people wouldn't actually that they were really in a safe environment, so. You could do a standard disclosure to agreement at the beginning of these tours that says, you know, by going on this tour, you agree to take all responsibility for what may happen to you, and I think it's defensive. So if your hands freeze on the oars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, last question over here. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is to all the participants. Um, as part of your branding, have any of the panelists considered using an e-commerce add-on model? Is there something you could build on to help an institution, for instance, um, increase revenue? We've thought about um, that, that very question, of course, as I, as I mentioned earlier, when our regular tours are something that we charge for, um, and that so, um, so people, uh, have to pay. So it's a revenue stream. Are we, we, you know, the conversation at the board level in particular is, are we undercutting ourselves by offering uh, these tours for free? And so, um, and, and that led us to that discussion of wanting to actually make sure that there were things that we could do for free and that they were um, distinct from what we do uh, for, for a fee at this point because we want to make sure that everyone can participate. So the, the freeness of it was very important uh, to many of us who were working on these projects in the early way to, for our classrooms, um, for a, the broadest use of the public. Um, but we do know that this is something that people are concerned about, especially a lot of the scholars and the smaller organizations who are saying, I want to put my time and energy into this. And we're looking for new and alternate revenue streams. You know, what, what do we do? And, um, and at this point, we haven't expanded in, in Road Tour and, and really thought about the monetizing uh, of this process because we're very interested in, in the democratizing of it at this point. Um, but it is something that we are, of course, quite um, cognizant of and, um, and are thinking about you know, ways in which we can encourage use of these platforms, especially if an organization is doing it independently and therefore absorbing all of the costs on their own. It's also not, a, not, uh, it's not an in incredibly expensive, but it's not a cheap thing to do either. Um, so there are various platforms where you can um, have a, for virtual tours and for walking tours, you can have pay models. Um, we just haven't uh, explored it for this for the reasons of, of wanting it to be free. Yeah, and I also might look at Detour, which you know is commercialized, the audio walk. Um, and it seems like they're gonna be really successful. There are past um, you know, people who've done it. I mean, for example, this company called Soundwalk. And when I first started working on my project, I was doing research into them, and it looked like they basically shut down. I'm not entirely sure what their story is. Maybe he knows, um, but uh, yeah, I would, I would definitely like look at what they do on the commercial level, and maybe that can also apply to how you help to monetize these projects, you know, for your institution. So we have charged for the Beacon Hill tour, and um, I would say if you're planning on revenue, don't count on it. Um, <laughs> We did get, you know, I'd say a significant amount of revenue, but nothing close to what it cost uh, to build these. You know, we got a $50,000 grant to build it, 
and you know we recouped maybe 10 or 20 percent of that in what we charged for downloads. We decided just to make it free because it was more important that people experienced the project than that we tried to recoup some of our costs. Um, Detour uh, actually is absorbing the sound walk that failed. They tried to they tried to charge for downloads. They had a very sophisticated platform that allowed you to do an in-app purchase where you got a bit of the content and then you could charge to get the rest of it, uh, and it failed. And Detour right now, I think, is trying to figure out a price model where they can produce these fairly cheaply and they charge usually five bucks for each of them. And I think that it, the jury's still out. You know, you get a few really impassioned people that give it a high rating, but it doesn't cover the full costs of making it. The one thing I have seen that's very interesting, especially for people who have gift shops, is that they're selling now um, very small audio devices for uh, 10 to 15 dollars that come with headphones and they, I'm sure they're manufactured in like China and they cost you know maybe three or four dollars to purchase directly and then you can load audio tours on that and package them and sell them in a gift shop for 15 to 20 bucks so people can buy something that's preloaded now it sounds kind of ridiculous if you could just stream it from your phone but I've been surprised uh, at a company in St. Louis that's actually doing fairly well selling these 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 small disposable you could say disposable audio guide devices in in, in, shop, in shops. So we add with Mike. Thank you. <laughs>